I didn't know you were so tall. Dude, people, that's like the first thing. It's, it's always the height. in person. It's the height thing. People are like, dude, you're actually pretty uh, energetic in person too. I'm like, that's a win. But then everyone's like, yo, you're pretty tall. I'm like, I guess when I'm filming like this and you only see that 0.5 angle, it's a little harder mm. to contextualize. 0.5, you're kind of, yeah. yeah, you're warped. Exactly. <laughs> it looks, it's deceiving. Just so people can understand, you are what, 195, 190 to 195? 190, 195, 62. You are a big man, especially for a runner. Yes, that's do you, for sure. Do you uh, intentionally lose weight or have you lost any weight to try to run? Or like, what's your kind of take on that? I don't think I've lost weight because even when I played f football at Monmouth, I was sitting right around 195. Really? I, yeah, I played I played receiver. So I wasn't like 210. Like I wasn't one of those mm -hmm. kinds of receivers. I was probably 195, 200. But I definitely had more muscle mass. Mm. My endurance wasn't built out yet. So I don't think I had any goal of like, all right, I need to get to this weight so I could run at this speed. I just wanted to find that balance of like, all right, can I still kind of eat the way I eat, train the way I train and move my body and have a good balance? Mm. And like, I found that even at 190 now, I, found, I have a good balance. I'm not in pain. Mm -hmm. I'm able to strength train and still lift heavy and be able to run the miles I do. This has to be talked about because I don't know how much people know about this, but uh, the quote that I said today when we were running and you got really excited about it, I said, if you run long enough and you run far enough, what's going to happen? Your body's going to change. No, you're going to shit your pants. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> He's like, it was a deep one. I know your body's going to change. <laughs> your body, <laughs> no. Now your body will change, but you will definitely take a shit. I'll, I promise you that one. I've, the, I've had that too often. I don't think people know about like the gels and the electrolytes and like the shifting of like, if you're trying to drink water when you're running, <laughs> people are trying to take in carbs and a bunch of different things. And you got the goo packets and yep. all this stuff, right? So all kinds of mayhem can happen in the stomach as you're running, right? And a lot of those products, you know, they're made with sugar. They're made with some form of sugar. So it sits in your stomach and it digests fast. But when you're rumbling around in there and you're not eating many whole foods, there's nothing to absorb all that stuff. So mm. the gel, it kind of goes to your system, but it then can cause you to shit. <laughs> and then when you're on like a mile 18 and you're freaking going through a marathon, it's like the worst feeling of like bubble guts. Could you imagine running with Bo? And I hope this doesn't happen to you in Boston, but just the thought of like, I had, I knew I had to kind of take a shit at like mile 10 oh. and I held it in actually. Cause I'm like, I don't want to like mess up my groove. And I took two shits before the marathon. And I, I've gotten a good system where I drink my black coffee. I have my morning thing. And I'm like, I make sure I get it out. And most runners do have that process. But yeah. even in a race, man, you just, the beautiful thing about marathons is you have, you have a plan, but then so much, so many things happen and your plan could go to shit and you just got to, no pun intended, yeah. but you just got to be ready to adjust. Yeah. And I think that's really what I've learned through my marathons. Uh, but you also have to have the art of shitting fast because you were talking about during the Houston Marathon, you were running some amazing splits and then you had to take a quick 20, 30 second shit. Now, how was that process? Because you got to wow. shit, wipe, put everything back on, run. What? How's that work? Do you guys want the full details? Yes. yes. He probably made an Instagram post during <laughs> that. Shit too. I wish I had the flex. I wish I had enough time to do that. But um, talk about productivity hacks. Yes. Yeah. yes. It's a, it's it's a fast transition for sure. I think I was thinking about this too. Actually, of like, how do I get that done so fast? And part of it is as you let it all build and. I said it, right? I was having to shit for like six miles. Yeah. So that, first of all, it was a thought in the back of my mind. Number one, build pressure. <laughs> there we go. Okay, I follow. But to, yeah, build a little pressure so it kind of is at that point of like, it's ready to go, yeah. yeah. And then when you have an opportunity, you see a porta potty. I told my brother, he was on an e-bike. I'm like, yo, look ahead, find a porta potty. Let me know if you see one ahead. And he was like, there's one coming up on the left right after this uh, water station. I'm like, perfect. I, I went in it, locked the door really quick and just literally... Pull my pants down, just immediately shit it all out. <laughs> but at wow. this time, I had to pee too. And I didn't pull my shorts down far enough, so I was peeing on my pants. Oh, oh no. So I'm already soaked and sweaty. It's humid as shit in Houston. And I'm just like, oh God, just another thing to add to the list. But <laughs> I didn't shit on myself at all. I just, I got it all in the porta potty. But after I'm like, my shorts are already drenched. I'm like, God, I got urine all over this now. Mm quick wipe two mm -hmm. wipes and i'm like fuck it it's good enough yeah and i'll take a shower at the end i'm like and i just started running again and like immediately it's like the mindset of like can you get back into your pace uh -huh. get back into the flow and at that point i had nine more miles and it's just like all right one foot in front of the other and you know it was starting to warm up but trying to just kind of get back into the rhythm those guys that are at world record paces they must just sometimes just go in their pants right mark i've seen women have shit coming oh, down their shorts. I, no. I lie to you not, bro. I'm telling you, marathoners and runners in general, like there's a different level of like 
callousing that and I, I've seen some shit I, and, and once again no pun intended but there it gets to that point people shit in their pants and they just keep rolling Dude. Nike's gonna make some like Depends <laughs> undergarments <laughs> honestly right? that, like, so that would be a great idea but yeah yeah tear away is, is, hasn't somebody figured out a way to like systematize going through 26.2 without having to take a shit like mm. wouldn't there be a digestive process or ways to handle that's everything that's a good call you know I do think a lot of coaches will recommend that you practice with particular brands of electrolytes yeah. And particular foods in your prep. But again, sometimes you might go to a contest and you might have these particular gels and some of these particular things, but then what they hand you at the contest could slightly be different, right? 100%. Mm. The water stations, every race is sponsored by a different brand. So this one was Gatorade, uh -huh. but some of them are like Tailwind, some of them are Goo. So every race you go to, if you don't pack your own nutrition. People have like PTSD, like I'm not no, drinking any of that. Yeah. <laughs> and it, 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 honestly, some people do, and it kind of screws up their whole um, routine for the race. But mm. you have to kind of, one, to your point, figure out in training what works for you. So then at least you can have the gels that you know that work with your stomach. Then the water and actual hydration stations that have electrolytes, you like, for me, I try not to like let it play too big of a role because then you're always going to be having that anxiety of like, oh my God, they have Gatorade this time and I'm not going to, you know, and like then mm. it, you start to feed that doubt of like, oh, are you not going to do well now because they don't have the brand that you use? Right, right. So I think there's a level of like one testing different stuff, but also you kind of got to use what they got, you know, because unless you're going to pack your own water and hold the bottle for the whole uh, marathon, mm. you kind of have no choice unless you're not going to drink anything. I'd mm. imagine you'd probably want to like start <laughs> like literally poop training, like you wouldn't, like you would block off the time that you'd gonna, you're going to be running and like for a month leading up, like I just don't shit between, you know, whatever, 10 a.m. and, what, you know, whatever the, the, the ending is. hundred percent. It's also partly because every race starts at a different time. People also train at a different time. If, if you're not a morning mm -hmm. runner and you typically train midday or in the evening, your body gets so used to training in that time of the day. Most yeah. marathons are in the morning. Mm -hmm. So if you've never trained in the morning and have your body even have that stimulus of one running at typically like a fasted state, mm -hmm. um, you're you're not going to know what your body needs to shit. You're not going to have mm -hmm. those feelings, you know? Mm -hmm. Like I go on runs in Austin in the mornings, some training runs that are just eight miles easy, nine miles easy, whatever it is. And I have to fucking shit on those runs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I've done it at an obnoxious amount where I'm just like in the woods, shit, I don't even wipe. And I, got, I just go home and shower immediately. These are these are no. runs Monday to Thursday. Nah, we, we, our now. boy DJ Webb. Yeah. Yeah. He has, court. Yep, yep. He, he had to go so bad he couldn't get home. So like he found like a tennis court and a gate and he just shat through the gate <laughs> and then wiped and ran away. It's You know the people that have that tennis court, like they were fucking yeah. hating life on that day. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, that's Jesus so Christ. Funny. Runners you know, are disgusting. Oh yeah. It's like now, <laughs> they are. Wow. We are. We are more rugged than maybe people thought. Yeah, <laughs> this is hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> I. Uh, <laughs> we are kind of joking around about a bunch of stuff here, but there is like you know routine and For sure. like uh, a run can take a long time. You know, some people are running ultra marathons. Some people uh, make take them three or four or five hours to finish a marathon. Like that's a huge amount of time devoted towards just the actual event itself. And then you have like the lead up to the event and you have the aftermath of the event. How are you going to recover from this? Um, I do think that your nutrition beforehand would also be interesting. I kind of wonder if you were to eat some kind of solid foods beforehand, you had what comes to mind in my head, just because it's always been easily digestible for me. Um, and I eat like a lot of meat and like rice and potatoes and stuff like that, but I would probably eat some bread I don't know why that comes to mind. I don't know why I always think that bread is like something that absorbs mm -hmm. stuff well, but uh, it's been stuff that I, I ate since I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, when I was sick, my mom would like to make soup and bread or soup and crackers or those kinds of things. They're real easy to like hold on to. Mm -hmm. doesn't seem to hurt your stomach. Even when you're puking your guts out, it seems like something that you can kind of hold down. So I kind of wonder like, what are some foods that you have before beforehand that maybe can help your stomach to be better when you're running? And I think this is something I'm still trying to like go through the weeds on and really figure out to your point of like joking about the like the videos of what I eat in a day that are kind of obnoxious. Um, I think one, to answer your direct question, PB&Js is typically my go-to. Yeah. I'll do like an Uncrustable just because it's mm -hmm. easy, it's packageable. I don't have to go out and buy like peanut butter and then bread. And then I just want to interrupt just for a second. People are thinking, man, this is like some highly processed food. This is crazy. I think sometimes there's an advantage to processed food because it's already processed yeah. slightly for you. Uh, some people can be like, no way, that's going to blow out my stomach. But 
I don't, you might have to try it. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And there's actually a different brand called, um, I think it's called Chunks. Mm. It's, a, it's a healthier version. It's not mm. as processed, but the same thought process. It's a packaged PB&J sandwich. It just has better ingredients. God, that mm. sounds so good. Yeah, yeah. That, it's, it, that one might be a better alternative. But if you don't have that at your local Trader Joe's or wherever you're at where your race is, you have to plan ahead. So worst case, if you get an Uncrustable or any PB&J sandwich, at least you'll get a little bit of carbs, some fat, some protein, and you just kind of have that as like a base. And then you go on your run and you just start, and then you begin your journey of using the gels mm -hmm. as your nutrition for those couple hours. Um, Looks like they're called Chubbies. Chubbies. That's yeah. what it is. Chubbies. I like Chubbies. that. Yeah, oh, so it's yeah. one of my friends actually sent this to me for New York, but I completely forgot it at my dad's freaking uh, house in, in in Queens. But Looks nonetheless, so you and I, you and I were discussing this a little bit. I, let's just back up a moment. I think um, an area that some people might be missing, and I'm new to running, and this is all just like me just spitballing. And I shared some stuff with Ensema uh, and a few other people. <clears throat> you know, I lost like ten pounds on a run. And it wasn't the summer, and and I had a lot, quite a bit of liquid with me. Um, I am a bigger guy. I think sometimes having that extra muscle mass uh, could maybe lead you to dehydrate even more, maybe even faster to some degree. And so maybe it's something that uh, maybe the bigger guys might have to pay a little bit more attention to. Um, but in most cases, most coaches, most strength coaches will say it's not really acceptable to lose more than like. 2% of your body weight during a competition of any kind. And you might say, well, okay, well, you got like, you know, something like an ultra marathon. Maybe it's like unavoidable because the amount of uh, output that you have per how long you're going, you can't really replenish fast enough for that to actually work out well enough. And you could maybe say the same thing for a marathon to some degree, um, but we should be able to really mitigate that a lot. Like if someone's to lose 10 pounds, even though they brought liquid with them, can we switch things around to where they only lose five pounds? Because I'm just thinking like in my head, most of the stuff that I know about dehydration is that dehydration is a real no-no and it's something that um, you can lose quite a bit of strength on. So these uh, packets that people have when they're running, these are supposed to help kind of mitigate some of that weight loss, but the packets themselves don't weigh enough for you to really mitigate the loss, like we need actual weight. We need actual like liquid with us. And the challenge would be like, how do you carry all that shit? I know people have like packs yeah. and these different things. Uh, but I think even for yourself, it'd be really interesting uh, to learn maybe when you go and try some of these runs, if you had more liquid with you, I'd be interested to know if you feel like you can run faster, or have more energy, being more hydrated. It's, I, I'm sure I would. The funny thing is, Mark, I feel like for me, and I always, my coach always gives me shit for this because I try to make the training like so much tougher by like going fasted, by not bringing water. Like I won't bring a water unless it's 13 miles or more. Like even my track workouts, 800 meter repeats, 1000 meter repeats, 400 meter repeats. I can do that whole workout, hit my splits, hit my times with no water. Mm. Is that ideal? Probably not. But the ability to do that in mm -hmm. that state with nothing, I know for a fact that when I go run to my marathon, I'm going to have water every two miles. I know I'm going to have gels and nutrition. I'm going to have electrolytes available. So that should only make it easier for me in that mm -hmm. when it comes race day. And has that been like what's happened for you? Like Typically. in application? Yes, 1,000%. Yeah. Yeah, today we ran eight miles and nothing. we didn't have any liquid. Yeah. You, yeah. Just, you just kind of go in. Like I, I've gotten a good point of like really relying on fat as fuel. Hmm. And typically I intermittent fast all the time. I have a high fat diet where I eat tons of avocados, lots of nuts, a lot of oils, even though you don't see it in those vids. Um, but I think my body has gotten used to relying on fat as a fuel, not just carbs and glucose. And in the mornings, I don't feel the need. Like I'm not hungry in the morning. I'll go rip that run, eat a smoothie right after and be like, I, I can still wait until I eat my first meal right around 11, hmm. which is like a fat brunch. And then I kind of start my eating window right at that point. Is this how you started or did you switch to this after some time, especially because you were a former football player? So how did that progression of your nutrition happen? A lot of this one, I started to learn more about nutrition knowledge in general during COVID. Oh. So at the time, my mom was actually a type two diabetic. So she just needed to reduce a lot of sugar mm. and increase movement. And instantly she lost 20 pounds in like three months off wow. just doing that. She walked more, like five mm, days a week. Good just for her. Walking. That's great. Yeah, she and she crushed it. And she was she was not a uh, she was she wasn't a diabetic anymore. Um, but she started doing a bunch of research on just like the keto diet and just seeing how that really helps type two diabetics. Mm -hmm. So she went full like keto, one meal a day, mm -hmm. fasted, heavy fats, 
and still having proteins and stuff, I would use her knowledge, gain that knowledge and be like, all right, well, there's pieces of that that are really good principles. Mm -hmm. Then I would kind of start incorporating my own education. I have a precision, precision nutrition cert, but I think even more than just that certification, guys like Mark Hyman, guys that are in the food space, I just kind of started consuming their content mm -hmm. and figuring out what are the healthiest fats and proteins and carbs and still just being very well-rounded. So that's kind of where it came from. But during COVID is when I started running. So I would take these principles and I would just start applying it to the challenges or the runs that I would go on. And then I was like, all right, well, I feel pretty good running five miles with no food before it. I would just eat right after. So I just kind of had that mentality and that practice, which then kind of led to some of these further distances mm -hmm. and maintaining those same principles. Pat Project Family, how's it going? Now, we talk about sleep all the time on the podcast because it's one of the biggest things that helps you with your health and fitness, your recovery, your muscle gain, your fat loss, everything. That's why we've partnered with 8Sleep for such a long time now because the technology behind the mattress allows you to track your heart rate, the amount of times it takes you to fall asleep, your tosses and turns, your heart rate variability. It changes its temperature through the night based off how you sleep, but not only yourself, but maybe your partner on the other side of the bed. It is an amazing mattress. Andrew, how can they learn more? Yes, head over to 8sleep.com slash power project. That's eight spelled out, E-I-G-H-T, sleep.com slash power project. Along with more information, you guys will actually save $150 off of your entire order automatically. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Let me ask you this. You started running in 2020, and now like when you look at your splits and how you're running, it seems like you've, obviously you've been an athlete for a long time, but it seems like you've been running forever. So I'm, I'm curious because a lot of people are getting into running since Mark's been getting into a lot of running too. Do you remember your beginning stages of like starting runs and the difficulty and maybe what are some concepts that you think people should try to keep in mind as they're trying to become better runners? I love this. Um, I think the first thing I would say is to, to start slow. And to just like build your foundation. Everyone wants to look at what other people are doing and get so amazed, like, oh my God, how fast they are or how they're able to run consecutively or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I think you need to start wherever your starting point is. For me, the first introduction to running for me was doing the Murph workout, 30 days. The CrossFit Murph workout? The one mile, 100 pull-ups, 200, uh, 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, one mile. <laughs> I did that 30 days in a row. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> 30 days in a row. What the fuck? I am. <laughs> <laughs> like, Why? Able Wait, to actually do what? <laughs> yeah, 30 days in a row. I, you didn't die? Whoa. I didn't die. My, my body got so adapted. So what I did was typically this workout's done with a 20 pound weighted vest, right? The cross. Someone game. just turned the pot, the podcast off. He's like, fuck this dude. Like <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> but I swear to God. So that was my introduction. Wow. And what? then I started to build off that. So if you think about the end of the month in 30 days, you get 60 miles accumulated. Yeah right? Two miles every day. That's very doable for most humans. The other, you know, the, the lifts and stuff, maybe not as much. Mm -hmm. 100 pull-ups, it's, it, it's aggressive. You have to break it up. But the two miles, that was doable for me. And even though someone that wasn't a runner, I was just an, I was an athlete. I was a trainer at the time, yeah, yeah, yeah. training okay. different modalities. But that opened up my eyes. I'm like, oh shoot. I just did 60 miles, whatever the amount of pull-ups and push-ups and squats. And from that moment, I just used that as like my foundation mm -hmm. and I just slowly built it up from there. The next challenge I did was 2000 jump ropes every day for 30 days. <sighs> what do we talk about plyometrics? Plyometrics is one of the best things mm -hmm. for runners because it's literally creating the exact mm -hmm. simulation that you're gonna go do for your running. So those 60 days, I was able to accumulate 60 miles and then over 60,000 steps, 60,000 hops. Mm -hmm. And that really create this elasticity in my Achilles, my soleus, my gastro, my foot. That's where my strength came from for my feet. Can I ask you a question real yes. quick? Don't, don't He's forget. He's got jack tendons. Oh God, his feet <laughs> his are feet. something. I wish I wish we had a picture we could pull up during the podcast because those feet are wild. But I'll Send a video to Andrew. Oh yeah, please mm -hmm. send that and let's, let's pull it up. But don't lose your train of thought. <laughs> now, I'm thinking about all the volume you're putting on your feet. And even as I started, like when we started doing this barefoot shoe thing, I had so many different little issues that came up with my feet. But do you think because you played a lot of football when you're younger, I'm, I'm, I hope we get to your childhood at some point, because even when you were in the gym and you were just sitting in that squat so casually, it's like, uh, anyway, <laughs> with your feet, right? Um, did anything happen where you needed to adjust? Because 2000 jumps a day and all that mileage, you didn't need to slow down at all. You didn't need to adjust anything. I was able to complete both of those challenges. Yeah. My, my calves and my feet were able to actually tolerate it. Obviously there was levels of, of muscle stiffness because of just the amount of repetition and, and volume. Mm -hmm. um, but 
I guess to answer your question, it didn't start to, the change didn't happen until I actually started to run more. Then I started dealing with shin splints and plantar fasciitis. Okay. Sick, like really chronic pain mm -hmm. in both the shins and the plantar fascia. Then I was like going through this whole search of like, what do I need to change to stop this pain? Yeah. And then it goes to the second part of this is going easier on your easy days. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest epiphany for me. Every day I used to run, it was a tempo run. It was like me running at like, at that time it was like 7.15, 7.30 pace was pretty fast for me on like a tempo run. And I would run every single day like that. Mm. I no day was there in recovery run or an easy run. And this was just my lack of knowledge. I was just testing and trying to figure it out on the go. Yeah. But my body was breaking down because of all the volume, because of the load. So then when I started to peel it back, I'm like, hold on. Is it my foot strike? Is it the way I'm training? Is it the foot itself? Is it too much volume too fast, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of times when people have shin splints or plantar fascia, it's a lot of overuse or they're rump ramping up their training too fast or the shoes are just so poor that it has no cushion for them. Mm -hmm. It's one of those three things typically. So once I started switching out the shoes, I'm like, all right, well, the shoes isn't the problem. I'm switching out. At that point, I was wearing every single brand you can think of under the sun. Yeah. And I'm like, it's not the shoe. Mm -hmm. It was more, more my mechanics and my foundation as a runner. Then when I got a coach and I realized, they're like, dude, you did what in, in your last training block? And they were just shell-shocked. They're like, how the hell did you make it through? And that was when I really started to realize, I'm like, hold on. I'm still such an amateur in this game. Like, I, gotta, I really got to get myself around some smart people mm -hmm. that have been around, that have worked with other athletes. Even though I knew I was an athlete, I couldn't just take that ego and apply it into this sport where I didn't know the knowledge. So then I just started to seek more people that were advanced in the space or just had more knowledge than me. I think we forget, like, <clears throat> a lot of sports are played when you're really young. You know, uh, baseball, uh, soccer. Um, the kids kick the ball back and forth. They just, like, play. Um, you see this in a lot of other countries where that's kind of what they have access to. They have access to a ball. The kids just kick the ball around, and they become amazing soccer players. But it takes a really, really, really long time. And we forget that when you started playing baseball, that your dad or your uncle or your grandpa like took the ball, probably a larger ball than a regular baseball, probably something more the size of a softball. And they said, watch the ball. And they held it up and they shook the ball a bunch. And they would throw an underhand pitch to you, which is a slower pitch than an overhand pitch. And you would watch the ball and sure enough, you'd probably miss it. <laughs> and they'd say, hey, you know, keep your eye on the ball. Like that was a good try. Try it again. And you pitch it again, and then maybe the kid makes contact. Maybe he still misses. Maybe he. Maybe you give them that larger bat. They have that kind of that red yep. bat that looks like a uh, like a big club, right? <laughs> you got that giant bat. You have a giant ball, and now they make contact. They get success with it, and over like a long period of time, they start to learn this. But we don't recognize that like when it comes to something like running or it comes to something like lifting, uh, for some reason we get excited and we just want to like redline that right mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. And you forget that when you were a kid, when you would ride your bike and you would like go downhill and things like that, even as a young kid who's excited to do stuff that's adventurous and you want to do stuff that's a little crazy, you're not going to go flying down a hill 35 or 40 miles an hour right away. You're going to wait until you feel like you have more stability and you're uh, going to wait until you feel safer to redline it and to go that fast. You wait till you're more experienced. So it's interesting uh, as we're older, we just like want to redline these capacities and just, I'm going to go out and run seven minute mile like mm -hmm. every day. Sounds completely crazy. Oh, please. If you're watching on YouTube <laughs> and if you're listening, sorry, but you got to like, can, can you zoom in on that? I Look do zoom in. Does zoom you in. do? Okay, good, good. I know I sound like Graham, the barefoot sprinter right now, but like, <laughs> see these tendons, these strong lines that Ooh, go from, nice, from his right? toes all the way into mm -hmm. his calcaneus. And his toe spread too. So question, as a kid, man, did you like, I mean, what was your history as a kid? Did you guys wear shoes a lot? Were you just moving a lot? What? Well, in the Asian household, you know, they, they that deep squat you're telling me, right? The Asian squat. I didn't want to say it, yeah, but it's you an did. Asian squat, which Mark mentioned it earlier. Um, but the yeah, Asian the, calves. Yeah, the Asian the Asian calf and the Asian, and then we have the enlarged ones <laughs> here. Um, but I think the that that's kind of the foundation. Yeah, it was you know. I'm Korean. So, you know, kimchi is like a very known, I fucking you know, love kimchi. yeah, it's a fermented uh, cabbage. Yeah. Um, but I would always see my grandma, my aunt, my mom sit in that deep squat position and really like marinate 
the cabbage. Mm -hmm. And they, it was very comfortable for them. They could sit in that. So I think for me at a young age, I don't know if it is an Asian thing specifically, but I just got very familiar and close to that by just seeing it first yeah. and then applying it through sports and then just kind of my movement as a kid. Me, I had an older brother. Mm -hmm. We used to play sports all the time as kids. And, you know, I grew up with a single mom, so I didn't have my dad all the time. So Hey, another. Yeah, so sports <laughs> so, was like a really, it, it was an avenue. Am for, I way off in thinking that the kimchi is like buried outside or something, right? <laughs> Is that what some people do with it? <laughs> so kimchi, yeah, yes, it, it can be. It's typically actually okay. for most Korean households. They like put it in a jar. Yeah, and they, they put think it they in a jar. It. They don't, I mean, they, some bury it, but like they actually put it in a different fridge, typically in a garage ah, or a different ah. setting because the longer it marinates and sits there, mm. the longer that fermentation process happens, mm. the more pro probiotics you get, mm. the more benefits you get for nutrition wise. Yeah. Um, but yes, the longer it sits there, the chili paste and all those things, it makes it taste better too. Mm. So the longer it ferments, the better quality of kimchi you'll have. Yeah, so that's well, why when that's you go tough. to restaurants and stuff, and Cali has some solid Asian food, but Texas, not as much, no disrespect to Texas, but that's the one slack on Texas. There's no mm. Asian food yeah. but um you don't get as good when you're at a restaurant it's not as good as like if someone makes it homemade yeah so yeah. a lot of those mechanics like just sitting in a squat that stuff came natural to you because you've just done it you've seen it you've done it and you've kept it yes and, yeah. I, and, and as i've gotten older now i've realized that the human movement actually like being functional is the game i don't care as much about how much i can bench or deadlift or squat i want to move pain free in any movement that someone asked me to whether it's for mm -hmm. lacrosse running go jump here go pick this thing up and I want to just be capable. I want to be, I want to be hard to kill. Mm. Like that's how I always think about it. It's like, yo, yes, it's cool to run far, but can you also lift shit? Can you, can you run far while farmers carrying? Can you do anything that someone asked you to do? Like, can you do it capable? Like, can, are you capable enough in that sense? This is the Kelly Starrett deadlift challenge here. What is nice. the Kelly Starrett deadlift It's one challenge? deadlift and Kelly does this at 315. I just can't do it at that much weight, but it's one deadlift every 30 seconds for 20 minutes straight. Oh, so it wow. ends up being 40 total deadlifts. Mm. I think Kelly actually does this for 30 minutes. Um, but yeah, it's a, it, it, this what is a tough challenge. What weight you got on there? This is 225. Mm. Um, I haven't deadlifted in a while. I actually did this a couple weeks back and I did 275 and I pulled my back. Mm. And it was a big ego crunch at like miles, <laughs> at, like, at minute 17, I had three more reps. And I'm like, God damn it. My back got pulled. That's <sighs> okay. I pulled my back warming up with 315 once <laughs> on a warm up. Just pulled my shit because of stupidity. So Ego. You're, you're good. It, it happens. You're it good. happens. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's important. I think lifting is important and having a strength base. We hear a lot of runners talk about having a uh, an aerobic base. And um, I think there's a lot of confusion in running. When people are first getting into it, they're confused about what pace to go at. Uh, they may hear of people say math, and then there's also the math atone method, mm -hmm. and they're unrelated, even though they're the same thing. In some sense, there's uh, your maximum aerobic function, uh, which is something that was discovered, I believe, also by Dr. Mathetone, who wrote books on training in the 80% range. Um, but they're, they're not exactly the same thing. And I think people get confused at what percentage to run. And then they see people posting their times and they see someone like yourself with proficiency uh, in running long distances uh, in, in these six minute mile paces. And uh, people are probably like, well, shit, he's real pretty advanced. Um, I feel pretty fit. I should probably be able to run like eight minute miles. And they go out there and they try it and they're like, whoa, mm -hmm. wow, that was embarrassing. That was really, really uh, difficult. And so where does your training, like you were mentioning doing these like seven minute miles and you were doing them kind of almost daily. What did your coach help you do? And where do you kind of sit now with a lot of your training? Yeah, I think from the coach perspective, it was more just giving me like a blueprint. Right. I think for a lot of times when you're in health and wellness, it's like, you know, even like what we did in the gym today, it was a lot more free flow. Right. Like there was not like a plan. There was not mm -hmm. like certain weights that we had to hit. And that's actually what my strength training looks more like now, where I'm just I understand which muscles I want to hit that are going to help me as a runner. So that's kind of how I treat it. I call way. it an, an intent, having an, 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 it, an intent of the day. Exactly. And, and, and for running, I never really had that because I didn't know what the foundation was. Mm. So when I first got a coach, I actually worked with uh, Nick Bear's coach, Jeff Cunningham, when I hit mm. my first sub three. And it just, it showed me like, I just looked at the week and at a month outlook of just like, oh shoot, most of these runs, he wants me to just go at an easy pace. There's no time. It's just go get miles time on your feet. 
And I started realizing, I'm like, all right, well then there's no pressure for me to run fast. Just yeah. take this easy, let my body really create blood flow, let it recover itself, even on these quote unquote longer runs. Did he advise you to not go too fast or he didn't yeah. say anything? Really? No, he did. Okay. Cause I told when I, when I first told him, cause I, I first started working with Jeff after I ran the Austin marathon last year, I was looking to get a sub three. I hit a 305 on my own. And I told him, and he's like, Matt, if you hit 305 on Austin, which is a hilly course, he said, you're going to break sub three. You're right there. He said, we just got to break down your training and look at it at a bird's eye view and see what's happening. And then he was just like, all right, well, looking at your easy days, take those with no pressure. Don't even look at your watch. Just go run and go off a of feeling. And if you're breathing really hard, then you're probably going too fast. And it's just that, that mixture of understanding yourself and your body. Obviously, if someone watches my stuff, they're gonna be like, oh, like, I wanna go do eight miles. Well, that would probably be pretty stupid to do. So break it down smaller and, and just kind of feel it, right? If you go on two miles and it seems super easy and you're breathing well and you have a conversation with whoever you're running with, that's a good sign that that pace, that area is a good, easy pace for you. Mm -hmm. Conversational, right? So that's kind of the first thing for, for me when it was like, oh, shoot. That whole messaging of like my own thought of like, I have to run fast to get faster. Why the do you think that makes people better? Like running at that speed, like the speed that we ran today, mm -hmm. do you normally run around that speed or do you run slightly faster? Than Probably that? a little fast, like 8.45 to nine. Okay. But I think the science behind it is like, obviously as you build up your aerobic capacity, it's like building out an engine, right? Even though an engine can go up to a hundred miles an hour, it can't sustain that speed forever. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is with your body. Like you can't hold that maximum mm. velocity for 26 miles, but you could probably hold 70% of that velocity, 60% maybe. So until you build your engine strong enough to sustain that much volume, it's always going to feel like, <sighs> if you feel like that at 10 miles in a marathon, shit, you got a long way to go still, right? Mm -hmm. So it's building that out. And I think the biggest thing I learned from running is just being patient right? There's nothing sexy about this. There's nothing sexy I'll say today that's like, oh my God, I got this running secret. No, it's you got to put one foot in front of the other, take care of your body as best as you can and stay patient along this process. Cause I didn't, I ran four marathons before I ever ran a sub three mm. trial and error all the time of figuring out what system is working. How do I get this? How do I get my nutrition down? How do I sustain these speeds? But you have to be okay with like overcoming some failure along that way. Cause if not, you're always going to be in your head of like, oh, I want to run a half, I want to run a full, but I don't know if I'm there yet, I don't know. I, and you're always going to be in your own mind. Mm. So I think a part of me was like having the blueprint, but also having the mindset of like being okay with failing, being okay with not getting the job done. Because I know that as long as I'm alive, I'm going to have a fighting chance at some point. It might not be today, but in a year, who knows? So that's always been my framework I, once I got out of football. And I want to just continue to have that as I go on in life. I like what you're saying. I think it sounds to me like it, so much of it is about what you can recover from. So if you, we talked also about the mindset and how important it is to just go for it sometimes. So it's going to be important for you to occasionally let a rip and go for six minute miles. But uh, the duration of that run is going to be shorter. Like that might be something where you do uh, three miles mm -hmm. and you just kind of like literally see how fast you can go and you go with some of your buddies that are real fast and you just let let loose uh, or you do a day where you're doing uh, some interval sprints or something like that and you're going much faster uh, but there's a regard to when the intensity is high the frequency will be lower or if the intensity is high the duration will be lower if the duration is super long the intensity will be low and vice versa and, mm -hmm. it, and you have to kind of have some sort of map of any combination of those things or some people that will say you can get extremely fit and build out your maximum aerobic function by being a sprinter as well. And they're actually right. Like there's not anything that somebody like Hussein Bolt can't do. Like there's no reason why he wouldn't be able to run a marathon mm -hmm. um, probably quite easily. Now, if he wants to become more proficient at a marathon, he'll have to play that game a little bit more. But you can get there with high intensity work but you would have to back down the amount of times that you do it so that you can still recover from those workouts. Mm. I, I, because I'm from football, I have that thought process where it's always the same thing, right? It's like coaches are different. Coordinators are different. There's different ways to win a Super Bowl. There's different ways to run a marathon, right? To your point, like, you know, that thought process of the Maffetone method or even taking 80% of your runs easy, 20% more aggressive. Some people don't follow that actually. And they're faster. 
they're actually they some people run hard every day and their body's so used to that that much intensity mm. that they've calloused that muscle in their mind as well they're or they've calloused those muscles in their body so there's I not, said fuck it let's see what's true 100 percent. so like even like a ken ride out right ken does 10 miles every single day and with one long run that's his that's his program. He says it every day. You can look at his Strava. He runs at like a 615, 630 pace every day, and he goes out for one long run once a week. Guy lost his mind somewhere yeah. along the way. How long has he been like at is he like a, he's been doing this for a long time? Ken is 55. He's got he's actually the record holder for the fastest marathoner at 50 and above. It's at Boston, he had a sub 230. Bro, he's running like 545 pace. Is He's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. This guy lying about his age. What's going on? No, he's. That's wild. It's like, show me the birth certificate. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I say that to say there's obviously so many ways what a stud. to. Yeah, what was speed. his name? Ken what? Ken Rideout. R I D E. R I D E and then O U T. Hey, props to that guy. Yeah, Holy he's, shit. He's, it's, he's a beast. And almost every race he goes to, he wins in his age group. Wow. Like running 230 is something. It's. Running sub three is a feat. Running two thirty is on some other shit. Like mm -hmm. he's prepped his, his body and, and he's a lifter. He's he's got muscle. He's not like a really yes. When, when Andrew pulls him up, you'll see. In he a, honestly has more of a he has more of your build, mm. shorter, stockier, and he rips miles. What uh, is there for competitive uh, marathons? Mm -hmm. Is there uh, any is there any blood doping drug testing? I would imagine, not, like, if you do it in the Olympics, there would be... I'm sure in the Olympics. I'm not sure for, like, these races that are, like, kind of, like... Am I going to get popped is what I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Somebody listening to this show right now. They're going to be like, yo, he's Mark in Bell's a, running in uh, in, in, in uh, Boston. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, he's, he's got some muscle it. on him. Oh, Zoop. I think I've seen this guy before. He was on, um, recently, uh, he was on Rich Roll's podcast. What an animal. Wow, yeah. look at those delts. Yeah. And those. Yeah. Wow. Impressive. This dude is a beast, dude. He's ripping. <laughs> Jesus. Man. He's actually gotten faster every single year. Wow. Every year he's hit a PR time in the marathon. Wow. All right. So, huh. you know, there's so many things we're talking about right now, but you are a large runner. Like, you know, when you, when you look at your physique, specifically your legs, you're jacked, right? Um, do you know, because you probably get a bunch of steroid accusations. Mm -hmm. Do you know if like Ken gets the same thing from that community? Because like he's so like he's jacked and yeah. he's running some really good times. I really don't know. And yeah. I don't, I'm not going to speak on it for Ken. Fair. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think at any point, because now the running demographic is getting so big, uh -huh. people that are outside runners or at, outside athletes are getting into the space. So there's yeah. always going to be some speculation, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had people DM me like, dude, what shit are you on? What juice? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I was like, bro, if I've been on juice, I, I would hope that I would look much swoller than this. But um, I, I understand why people have that speculation. I think at any point when you're doing things that seem challenging to others, yeah. there's always gonna be that assumption or speculation mm -hmm. of, oh, he's cheating or it's not possible for, the main thing I get now is how do I keep my body healthy? Because mm -hmm. people are wondering, I just ran New York two, two months ago, I had a marathon four months before that, and I'm gonna run Austin in 30 days. And that is like a lot of marathons to accumulate and it's not the best for your health, right? It's, it's, it's typically not, but if you've built up enough of a base in addition to like building out your, your body yeah. where, now, like, I just, I have a really good understanding of like how to recover myself and how my body feels after these marathons. Mm -hmm. Even after Houston, Monday, I was sore. I ran two and a half miles just to kind of flush it out super slow. Then I went into a plunge and I'm like, all right, that I felt solid. Then Tuesday, I felt a little sore, but today I felt good. It's, th it's, it's Thursday now. We went on eight miles this morning and I felt pretty strong today. So I think from what I've learned most above anything else, from a lot of Kelly Starrett and a lot of other PTs, it's movement is actually the best form of medicine. And yeah. you can sit on your couch after a big effort and be like, oh my God, I can't walk. But if you actually walk, if you are that sore and you just walk for like 10 minutes, it's actually amazing how good you'll feel after. And if you really just sat down and rested, you might turn into like concrete. You get even stiffer, <laughs> right? you get stiffer. Yeah. And, actually, and, and that's actually what's happened to some of my foot injuries. After a big effort, I would be like, oh my God, I needed some rest. And my foot would get so stiff and I would have this pain in the top of my, uh, my, my toe. Uh -huh. And I'm like, dude, what's happening? And I talked to Kelly. He's like, dude, think of your hand. He said, you need to flush a lot of that tissue out because it got so tense. So then I, it would cause my was foot. Was the pain uh, by your big toe? It was, it, was in the, it was in the arch of the foot. Oh, the arch, okay. But the pain would like, I would have this like feeling of like, it's like a twitchy feeling when I like touch my, um, when I touch my toe. And he was just telling me, he's like, there's actually this guy that he sent me, I forgot his page, but he was like, it's like this pencil theory where you get an eraser and you flush out these little 
like areas between your your skeletal muscles here. Yeah, between the, the tendons yeah, of the exactly. feet. Yeah. And then you start flushing it out. It's just like doing myofascial release, but you're doing it on such a small part mm -hmm. of the foot. And dude, instantly I felt better. Like the next day I told Kelly, yeah. I'm like, dude, I could run. On mm -hmm. the top of my foot, kind of in between the big toe and the second toe, there's a spot that I can push on and I feel all the way through my pinky toe. I feel all the way through the inside of my foot. And there's just something in there that like needs the pressure kind of like released and it gets better and better by just working on it. So is yeah, this what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly this. Yeah. I don't know how I, I think we've talked about this before, maybe a, a guest previously, but I do remember somebody talking about the benefits of specifically a pencil eraser yeah. too. <laughs> it's, it's the best form factor because the eraser itself is a uh, small. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. mm. You know, you multiple times you've mentioned the way your body's changed as you started running more like from the beginning till now. And even though you were, you know, you were a football player, you were a receiver, meaning you were running a lot. How did your body change as you started to run more and increase your frequency with running? Because I still find it shocking that you did Murph for 30 days and survived that, yeah. you know, so how much more change did you get? Like, what are you noticing? I think one, as I've kind of like stepped into wellness more, I've like tried to just like understand the body better. Mm hmm Right. And I think there's a mixture of like, obviously my, my base now, like when I, I can still go play football right now, it would be a little bit of a different stimulus for me though. Like I would probably need a day to throw on the cleats and like do more change of direction. Yeah. I know that I'm not working those muscles as much, but I think a lot of my base from football, a lot of the speed and agility, a lot of the fast twitch muscle fibers, mm -hmm. though that part of my training and lifestyle before has really helped in this sport where it's a lot more slow twitch. It's just your ability to get off the ground, kind of bounding off one foot to another. But I think the biggest change I've seen is just one, to your point of my lower trunk, yeah. that's where a lot of my muscle is now. Because I live on the sled going forward, backwards, side to side, and just finding different ways to train the lower body, mm -hmm. a lot of my muscle is now in the legs where before I was way beefier up top. Like I would be able to bench like 225, like probably for like 10, 15 reps. Okay. Where now it's like, I'm just not able to tolerate that much strength as much as much. But I think the biggest change has been in my legs. Yeah. And as much, they've, they've gotten a lot more durable. And through the ultras I've done, through the marathons I've done, it's really helped me just kind of like well round my whole system. Yeah. So that's probably the biggest thing. You've done so, ultras? I've done a 50K, 50 miler and a hundred miler. Damn. People need to address working on their strength. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people, they fall in love with running, which is yeah. awesome. That's great. They fall in love with some sort of movement. But I think if you want to get better at it and you have symptoms, like you're in pain. I love a lot of what you're saying. Like it's, that's wild that you can go out and play football. Like that's, these are goals that people should have. And I know that you're still young, but how cool would that be if you're my age and you can still say that like, yeah, I would need a couple weeks to train, but I could still go out and play some football. I could still go out and get open mm -hmm. uh, against a 25 year old guy trying yeah. to cover me or something like that's sick. I think that's really cool. And it's a really great goal, but for people to stay healthy, I think they're looking for the magic and we talk a lot about sleep and food and there's tons of stuff, but don't forget about the, how, how powerful it can be just to help yourself to get a little bit stronger. And it doesn't require, I love lifting weights. I know that you love lifting weights. We spend a lot of time doing it, but I honestly think people could spend two or three hours a week, maybe even a little bit less than that. Yeah. You probably get away with a little less than that. And maybe not a lot of it's even gym time. Yeah. Could just be some dumbbells, could just be a kettlebell, it could be body weight exercises, but you'd be shocked at what you can get from some strength training. It can go a really long way. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And I think the mantra in the running world has always been, you know, just run more. Like instead of, right, instead of cross training, if you take that extra 60 minutes, could you just get better if you ran more or did more cardio, right? And I think it's, it is one of those mentalities where nowadays there's so much research behind it. Yeah. You're seeing elite athletes and Kipchoge, I think is a great example of someone who still does strength training. Mm -hmm. And it might be at a low level where it's like, maybe just working through range of motion, doing mini band work, do really work on the small muscles, but he's doing something. And there's definitely a translation of strength in the weight room then to go translate that into your activity or your sport. And I think it's the way you're training in the gym, right? Because if you don't need to be doing Olympic lifts if you're a runner, but there's a lot of movements in the gym that simulate running, whether it's step ups or step downs or mm -hmm. lunging or, or, or uh, crawl, uh, what's it called, bear crawls. Um, there's a lot of different ways to create the same angles that you're trying to create in running 
in the gym. And I guess for me, it's like, I'm so used to it. Like, and I guess that that's kind of been my my world, right? Because I've always been around like football and like there's strength and speed and agility in football. Mm -hmm. You go in the weight room and then we'll come on the field and we're gonna do specific receiver stuff and just change the direction drills in general. So I've always lived in that world of being able to do both. So now when I got into running, I'm like, well, it makes total sense to keep lifting. Why would I just completely stop lifting and just only commit to running where I think there's a benefit to really doing both. And I think for most people, it's one, it's a lack of education for it, mm. right? But it doesn't have to be so complex. Everyone nowadays, they see all these things on Instagram, on social media where, oh my God, this guy's doing this crazy type of lunge or this crazy deadlift where in reality, if you can hinge, if you can squat, if you can split lunge and do some plyometrics and do single leg exercises, those five things will cover a lot of the basis for running. And you don't have to do barbells either. You can just do body weight or simply pick up some dumbbells. And people will kind of say, yeah, but I have shin splints. And it's like, again, if you just took a moment and got off your feet <laughs> and went into a gym and did some bent over rows or seated rows or dumbbell presses, uh, worked on your shoulders, worked on other areas of your body, not only is that working on building muscle mass potentially in another area, but don't forget, it's also getting you away from the thing that you love doing that's actually kind of giving you more damage to those particular areas. And it's like you said earlier, right? Like the, typically for growth, you have to go through some pain, right? Soft tissue sucks. Soft tissue hurts. And that's for most people, they need to sprinkle in a little bit more soft tissue and a little bit more strength. Those two pieces, in addition to running, you can create a beast runner. But like a lot of people don't do soft tissue either. It's like, I, I've realized that a lot of the people in Can in you the explain world, what soft tissue stuff soft is? Soft tissue yeah. is just like foam rolling, myofascial release. It could be with a lacrosse ball. It could be with a foam roller. It could be what I'm doing with this little blue thing right now, where I'm really putting a lot of pressure deep down into the fascia of my foot. But, but you know, the old mantra of stretch more when you're hurt or put ice on that injury is just so old school and it's been so proven that it doesn't work. Mm. It actually restricts more blood flow. And I think if anyone takes anything from this pod, it's understand that your body wants to create blood flow for it to recover. And the more you can do that in a soft tissue environment where pretty much you can watch TV, do your leisure activities, but just incorporate this little piece mm. into your lifestyle. And I think that's where a lot of my ability to stay healthy has been the hours where I'm not running and the hours where I'm not in the gym. Mm -hmm. When I'm standing at home in my office, I'm standing just like this. I have some form of a roller, a slant board, a balance tool, something where I'm stimulating my body even as I just stand here. Yeah. And I think when I'm, when I'm watching TV, I'll sit in the couch stretch and just work on my flexion all day or I'll get in boots or I'll do some form of myofascial release where the secret is in the other 22 hours of the day not the two hours you're in the gym or running. Yeah. But most people want the answers for those two hours where in reality, it's everything else that you're doing in your lifestyle. You can fix your own pain. It's an unbelievable thing. If you work on some of the myofascial release and Seema just grabbed this, uh, what is this thing called? Roller eight or something like roll that? Roll recovery, I think. It's on there. Roll, roll recovery. Um, this device is amazing. It's uh, kind of like a vice. Yeah. You can put your, uh, your forearm in there, your arm in there, or your shin. Uh, your or your quad, leg. Yeah. yeah, and you can work your hamstrings, your legs, your calves, your shins. There's a lot of great products out there on the market. You can also just get uh, a lacrosse ball, a softball. You can get these inexpensive things. And these are things, it's kind of amazing that you can heal yourself. You can just put a ball in the ground and literally just squish your foot on that ball. Mm -hmm. And you'll get so much relief and so much decompression of the feet uh, that you, you will kind of be in disbelief of how how great that will make you feel and how much uh, just congestion you can get mm. rid of for yourself. And then you can hire someone to help you with these things and that can be great. Um, I do both. I, I have someone that comes and tries to work on me almost every week. But in addition to that, probably, uh, I don't know, an hour every day is spent doing some sort of myofascial release slash mobility stuff. It's a liberating thing too. Yeah. If you're able to, to your point, heal yourself, because most people don't have the capacity or the, the money to actually pay for a deep tissue masseuse or to pay to get physical therapy or to pay to get dry needling done. 
the liberating feeling of having a foam roller or just a lacrosse ball, which costs less than $15, yeah. that feeling of like, oh shoot, I feel good. I feel recovered and go ready to go attack this next workout or the next run. It is something I think for most people, like it's a, it's a rewarding feeling. Mm -hmm. One thing I've noticed is like when it comes to stuff like rolling, a few years ago, it started getting kind of a bad rep and there were a few people saying, oh, it doesn't make that big of a difference. You don't need to spend as much time doing that. But like one thing that we've noticed is that we have a habit every day. Like every single morning I wake up, I have a hard roller at home. I'll roll my back, quads, everything on that. I use this thing while sitting down. That's why I really like this. Mark, Mark introduced me to this thing. So you can be sitting on the couch, you can just be standing and you can be smashing your quads and everything with it. But with like jujitsu and all the movement stuff that I do, that has been a huge habit. And I don't get as much body work done from like a PT as Mark does. But like you mentioned, I think it's huge to understand that you don't need to you don't need to see someone to get the benefit of all of this. Type you of don't stuff. really have uh, much restriction either. Like you, like I was showing you something. I was like, I got a lot of mm -hmm. like crazy tension right here with when I'm, when I sit on this, uh, this like medicine ball that we had in the gym mm -hmm. and you're like, yeah, I was like, I, you're like, I got like a little bit. So again, it's all like symptom related. Like if you have symptoms and shit hurts, you're going to have to spend more time on it. Yeah. If you don't have symptoms and you don't feel like it's a limiting thing, it's probably something you can spend a lot less time on. That is true. But one thing I do notice is that when I start to back off, because what we tend to do <laughs> is when we start feeling yeah, really good, we back, hygiene off, with it, yeah. we back off of the things that have been working. Mm -hmm. When I start to back off, then I start to, oh, oh, that little tightness is my lower back is coming back. Oh, my mm. glutes starting to feel a little tighter. Then you start the habit again. But if like you mentioned, stay ahead of it, stay ahead of it, bake it into your day. Like you were just talking about, which is what we do here. It then like you can get a point where you are pain free. Mm. Um, and on the pain free side of things, you've mentioned that multiple times. How long have you been pain free? Have you just, has that just been how you've been for a while now? Or I would say since I've been in Austin, prior to Austin, I had chronic shin splints. Uh -huh. So even last year, so it's it's right around this time, February of 2022, I ran the Austin Marathon. Mm -hmm. But four weeks before that race, I actually just like cut off a lot of my load of running because I had the worst shin splints. I couldn't go for four or five miles. So at the time is the first time I got introduced to Gota. And I really was, I was making my trip down. I moved from Maryland to Texas and I started making my road trip down. I stopped in Louisiana, mm -hmm. pit stop at the Gota guys and they kind of, they saw a lot of my mechanics and they saw some of my running videos and form. And they're like, dude, you have good form, but they're looking at where I was landing on my foot. Your so, hips is backwards. Exactly, right? <laughs> so they were all like, they, they go full all out of like being the back chain, which has helped. But I realized after that race, I'm like, hold on. That pain that I was talking about with the eraser came back. Mm -hmm. So that was around March through April where I was like, oh shit, something's wrong with my foot. In reality, it was just super, super stiff. Mm -hmm. So I would say from May till right around now, knock on wood, yeah. I haven't had anything major. Now I've done some stuff where I've like rolled my ankle on the trail and like uh -huh. that's different cause it's like a specific thing, yeah. but nothing for overuse. So I would say for the past like seven to eight months, uh -huh. I've had nothing drastic happen. And in those times I ran sub two, I ran two sub three marathons. I've completed New York, yeah. which was kind of more for fun, mm -hmm. but I would say I've been feeling pretty good since that point. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever tried the uh, monkey foot to be Alice race? Yes. You have, did that do anything for you? It's, because, well, real quick, one thing I've noticed when I was doing that, because I was getting shin splints before I was using that. And then afterwards, because like it takes your leg all the way down here. Sorry for my ashy feet, guys. Stretches but the foot. Stretches, yeah, stretches the ankle the tip, and shin. Yeah. And then you come into this and then it brings you all the way back. So you're getting that full range of motion while strengthening the tib. Did that make any difference for you at all? It's definitely been a, sm a sliver, I think. Okay. I think it's hard for me to be like, this is the thing, you know? Cause I've done, I've tried so much, right? Yeah. I've done the tib raise. I've done a lot of ATG stuff. I've done some go to stuff. I've done, I've really done anything under the sun that I've seen that's like, okay, it's foot specific, mm -hmm. ankle specific, shin or calf related. So I think the addition of all of it slowly has been what's helped me, okay. right? And it's like we talked about 1%, right? And if I'm hearing you right, running less may have been the overarching thing to help the most. Running less and running um, less intense. Uh, right. That I think has been the biggest piece. And then there's things underneath it, which is like the sled, getting into uh, minimalist shoes, getting out of running shoes all the time. So everything is now kind of compounded over the past eight months where it's like, oh shoot, now I think I got it somewhat figured out. Mm. And I, I'm, I'm far from an expert still. I mean, I'm only two years into running, man. I'm, I'm, I'm still very beginner in, in a lot of things, but 
in terms of me understanding my body, mm-hmm. I think I'm an expert in that at least. But Matt, like, my yeah. shoulder hurts when I bench. <laughs> <laughs> I bench twice a week. Yeah. I've been benching twice a week for the last several years. My shoulder's killing me when I bench press. I mean, I would, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I'm not going to. Hey have, bro, maybe bench a little bit less yeah, often. I mean, maybe lighten up the weight. Maybe try a different movement. Hold a plank first and see if that hurts. Right. I think <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really simplifying. Can things. you get in a push up position? Does that hurt? Yeah. Because maybe we need to back off for a little while. Maybe we need to rebuild. Maybe you need to just question a little bit of, not everything that you're doing, but maybe question a little bit of what you're doing. How has the barefoot shoe helped? Um, you, you're mentioning these things kind of helping uh, maybe in a small factor in terms of the shin splints. How do you think uh, a minimalist shoe has helped uh, with the shin splints? I think it's just from the foot level, the foot is getting stronger with every step that you take in a minimalist shoe. Right. And if you think about the goal of the technology in running shoes now, it's to make it more comfortable. Mm-hmm. Right. We're seeking comfort. And the squishy midsole, the carbon fiber plate, it creates an easy ease of use. Your foot doesn't have to do much work. So now when you eliminate that and you get into a minimalist shoe or a barefoot shoe, now you feel the ground. And every single step you take, and that's why there's a break-in period where it's like you shouldn't go from zero to 100, right? Because that would once again be stupid. Like starting maybe two days a week, slowly incorporating it on some small walks or things of that sort. But once that becomes a, okay, now I can do this Monday through Sunday. Every day I could wear a barefoot shoe and have no issue. I think over time, my foot has just gotten stronger. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that the barefoot shoe or minimalist shoe has been the only thing because it's not. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other pieces to that. But I think... One, it creates this level of awareness for me too, where now when I go to the airport or when I'm walking or sitting at Chipotle, I can go sit in my Asian squat and I don't care what the looks I get because I'm just like, I'm working on my mobility. It keeps me more cautious because at any point of the day, I could work on mobility. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just have to be when I'm at home or when I'm doing X, Y, and Z. It could be when I'm at Costco. I'm like, oh, there's a long line? Shit, Asian squat, I could work on the post chain, Mm -hmm. get some RDLs in, whatever. Um, So I think over time, it's just become it's like built into my lifestyle, my routine. And the minimalist shoes, you may run in them a bit, but you also are kind of using them strategically. You're not, um, you have certain runs where you'll run in like a, just a running shoe that's going to actually help propel you forward, right? Exactly. So, I mean, pretty much when I'm in most of my other runs, I wear some form of a running shoe. When I'm in the gym, I'm in always in a barefoot shoe. If I'm sprinting, I'll either go completely barefoot or get into a minimalist shoe because I can really the velocity when you're sprinting, it's forcing you to really get on your toes and be on the forefoot, Mm -hmm. right? So naturally you're going to be in a running gait that is really natural to the human body. Heel striking is not natural. There's nothing natural about it. That's why when you take your shoes off, there's very few people that heel strike when they sprint. Yeah, It just doesn't happen. It's not the, it's not the best, it's not the most efficient way for your body to pick up speed. Mm -hmm. So incorporating pieces of that barefoot sprint work has also been a big thing. Um, But yeah, I would say, I use barefoot shoes, minimalist shoes almost all the time when I'm not running. Yeah. yeah. And one thing we were talking about on the gym is you mentioned like you were on a trail and you did notice when you were using one of those minimalist trail shoes that your foot had so much fatigue and you just tell, tell them about what happened. Yeah. I mean, one of my friends wanted to go on a, a quick trail run and I had like a 16 mile workout that day. It was just mm-hmm. a long run, getting miles on the feet. The first six miles I wore these Vivo barefoots and we went through a trail. So it's a mixture of, you know, hiking, jogging, running, kind of mm-hmm. everything in between. Um, I felt pretty good for the first six miles. And this was the first time I really took barefoot shoes for a run. Yeah. So six miles, I'm like, all right, after I was done, I'm like, all right, did the math. I'm like, I got eight or nine more miles. And in my head, I'm like, that shouldn't be too bad, especially now I'm going to get into cushioned shoes. It should feel real easy. But mm-hmm. the back half of those miles, I started to feel more fatigued, like my entire body. Yeah. Because when you're in minimalist shoes or barefoot shoes, like the energy that you have to like use to focus on your foot placement, to focus on your foot itself it, it, impacting the ground, yeah. it's a lot of energy, mm-hmm. even though you don't feel it that much because you know for me at that point, six miles was like, a, it, it was more of like an easy run I could do. But then I noticed on the back half, it wasn't just the heat in Austin, I felt like I used more energy in those mm-hmm. first six miles. So even as I was wearing these Hoka shoes, I'm like, dude, why does this feel so hard? Like eight miles around a trail, like it shouldn't feel this difficult, but it did. And I think it's just, it shows you that when you're using barefoot shoes, it requires more out of your body and your mind. 
And that's why, Mark, like you've mentioned, people have talked about you having your, your Nike super shoes and they're mm-hmm. like, I thought you were barefoot shoes. Right. But those shoes tend to save your feet when you're mm-hmm. doing heavier mileage. And just save your like lower leg, mm-hmm. you know, uh, maybe for someone that doesn't have experience running, it might not be a bad place to start. Um, I do think that you can train your feet and you can, there's other ways to train your feet, you know, and, and I would say it's similar to like a lifting strap. Like straps and lifting, it might help save your elbows. It's going to allow you to overload. You're going to be able to handle more weight. But if you're someone that's power lifting and cares about having like a strong deadlift without straps, then you're going to have to also train your grip. And so in this case, you're going to want to train the feet, train the shins, train the calves, train the lower leg. But in addition to that, just wear whatever shoes feel good. Like uh, so much of running what I'm learning, so much of running uh, comes down to like what feels good for you. Mm. What food feels right for you. It doesn't matter if it's not encrustable. It doesn't <laughs> matter if it like doesn't fit this like particular diet protocol. Um, it doesn't matter that, you know, w- what you want to bring with you or what you want to wear maybe isn't the most ideal thing. What matters is how comfortable are you with it? Because sometimes you're running for several hours. Mm. It's got to be comfortable with it. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think so many people get into this analysis paralysis because there's so much information now. What shoes should I wear? Mm-hmm. What vest should I bring? What socks are going to help me? And I'm just like, dude, guys, like at, at the base level of all of this, it's, it's none of that, right? Obviously, you have to go out and just you have to put some work in because you have to understand your body and how it adapts. You're probably kind of slow. Yeah, I mean, if, and, and that's okay. And that's okay. You're probably kind of slow if you're trying to find the percentage in those other things. 100%. Like, just take your time, and over time, you're going to get faster. It's going to be all right. It's patience. Yeah. It's patience. What's the difference in your foot strike when you're using those different shoes on runs? Because, like, one thing I noticed is you gifted me one of those mm-hmm. ultra super yeah. shoes, right? And the first mm-hmm. run I did with you, and I'm like, I can like heel strike right mm. now without feeling any type of impact on my body. But if I try to heel strike at Vivo's dog, it's like, ah, you know what I mean? <laughs> so like, what's the difference for you? And what have you noticed when you're trying to run in those different shoes? Yeah, I, I think this is a great, great question, especially coming from the marathon because I was wearing the Alpha Flies, right? Mm. The, 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 the freaking super shoe. Um, and in the videos, like my brother took a ton of video and you can see my foot. It's kind of mid, mid striking. It's closer to heel striking though mm-hmm. because of how cushioned the shoe is and with the, the beveled edge, right? It almost forces your foot that way. Yeah. You can try to stay so heavy on the forefoot, but then you're not really using the energy return of the shoe, mm-hmm. right? The goal of that shoe is that it gives you a little bit of propulsion forward. So even when you're midfoot to almost closer to heel striking, you'll still have that like, oh shoot, I'm still able to push forward versus when I'm in like a, even like a Nike Pegasus shoe that has less cushion, that has less, doesn't have the carbon fiber plate. I have to focus more on like, all right, stay on the midfoot and kind of keep that repetitive strike. Mm-hmm. So now I don't, I wouldn't say I four foot strike as much. I'm probably more in that midfoot, mm-hmm. right where it's very efficient for my pattern. And I think that's also been an adaptation for me where it's like finding that middle ground of like not being so four foot like a sprinter, but also not heel striking like you're walking, right? Because we talked about it, like walking versus jogging versus running versus sprinting are four different movements. And each movement requires a different level of mechanics. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like that running and jogging space. You have to find out like what's the most efficient pattern for you because some, like my coach heel strikes. And he's a runner that's like a sub 220 guy. Mm -hmm. He's, and he's also a buck 40. So he's a smaller runner. He's been a runner his whole life. But at this point, it would be stupid for him to change his whole mechanic. He's already learned that pattern. And there's plenty of Olympic runners that also heel strike, right? You could look at Kipchoge, but then look at guys that are coming in at like maybe eighth or ninth or 10th place. Mm -hmm. They might be heel striking. So it's less of like what's better or what's worse. It's more what's better for you. Mm -hmm. And what can your body do? handle over a long period of time for a marathon or whatever distance you're trying to go. So even though so many people have different forms of striking at the highest level, there's nothing in your mind where you think in the long run, this would be the best way to learn how to run. Cause like everybody has different body types and for someone who's much lighter, a heel strike won't send as much impact up the body. Mm. But when you're heavier, I wonder, is there some type of foot strike that you'd want to try to learn or lean towards for your longevity within running? I don't know that, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts. I would say for most people, if you can mid foot strike, that's probably the most sustainable. 
Okay. Like just like, I think very simply, like even if you look at the data, like there's a lot of books on like the science of running where they mm -hmm. test different runners of like this percentage of runners for a marathon, forefoot striked, midfoot striked, heel striked. The time differences aren't very much, mm -hmm. but they noticed that a lot of the forefoot and midfoot strikers were the leaders of the pack. They mm -hmm. were the w closer to winning the actual race. Yeah. And not saying that the heel strikers weren't because there was a couple of them probably that were in like the top 10% echelon, mm -hmm. but they noticed that more more runners were midfoot or forefoot strikers that performed better. Mm. So I think for, in my trainer thought is, if you can develop a midfoot strike, it's a sustainable running mechanic. And if you can do that over a long period of time, you can start to really get faster and own that position. Mm. And some of these things might matter a little bit less when you're starting out because you're just moving slower. Exactly. Or at least you should be moving slower because you should be taking your time and you're not producing as much force. So it should be wreaking less havoc on your body. And so it would be a good idea at that time while you're moving slower to get yourself to strike in a place that, that feels good for you, that feels right for you. Some of the argument with a heel strike is interesting. I've heard people just say uh, that for some people that do heel strike, they're maybe just taking less overall steps because they are they might end up having a, a longer stride for themselves, not mm. a longer stride in comparison to somebody else. That's interesting. The cadence stuff is interesting where people talk about uh, 180 steps, you know, per, per minute. minute. Have you messed with that at all or found that to be anything I've, beneficial to you? Or? I've done some like research in addition to like testing on myself where I would like literally, I'd look at my watch, I'd be like, all right, 60 seconds. Let me count every single step. And just to see on an easy run versus when I'm doing like a, a speed play, like a fart lick workout, do I get the same amount of steps in? And typically on easy runs, I would average at like 80 to 85 steps because naturally you're not going as fast, mm -hmm. but you still want to be able to get that amount of steps in that same 60 seconds, whether you're going fast as hell or on an easy run. So then I would just track it like, all right, now I'm going to go at my speed play and I would get closer to 90, but it was about five off. Mm -hmm. And I know, and I think that's okay actually, because even on an easy effort, if you're able to create that many steps, which basically just means you're putting your foot on the ground. Right, because to get faster, you got to drive off the ground. It's less of you just picking up your knee; it's to push off the ground. Mm. Right. So if you're able to create those same amount of steps, that same cadence, whether you're running at nine minute pace or six minute pace, it means that you're you have a good understanding of your cadence as a human. So I think you should test it. It, it honestly gets a little bit crazy because you could look at watches, but typically watches are a little bit off. They'll tell you like, oh, 168, 169, mm. 171, whatever it is. But I would just take a minute time yourself, count each step, and then just do the math yourself. Mm. But I, I've noticed I haven't dove too deep into that stuff though. But it, it probably is just an indication that you are springy, right? If you're getting in the proper amount of steps. Exactly. Exactly. As Which I think is a like great thing for running. Moving slower and just heavier. Most people, right? the injury happens when they're spending too much time on the ground mm. between each footstep. And like that was one of the main principles in Born to Run where it's like, you want to spend as little time on the ground because the less time you're on the ground, which basically means you're elastic, right? You're able, right? Okay. So versus someone who's like this, like, uh -huh. and each step, because so, you think about how much pressure is absorbing in that one foot. Mm -hmm. It's typically 180 plus pounds of weight on one foot. The longer you spend there, the mm. more chance of injury happening. So you want to be bouncy. You want to be elastic in, in your foot and your Achilles level. Mm. Now, let me ask you this, because a lot of people who might be coming from the strength training side of things, let's say it's a power lifter, even a bodybuilder, where there's not much, there's quite a bit of stiffness in their gait, right? How would you help, like what concepts would you tell somebody to try to deal with in terms of getting rid of stiffness, opening up their gait? Because like if somebody that's really built tries to immediately start opening up, that's when some people pull shit, right? Mm. So what would you have them think about or try to do and, and progress? I mean, obviously both of you guys have mentioned going slow initially, yeah. right? But what do you think that progress looks like? I actually think for someone in that case, doing speed work could actually open them up. Not speed work where you're not warming up and you try to go freaking 50 yard, like 50 yard dash, but actually starting with some striders barefoot mm -hmm. would be a great foundation. You do some of that where naturally you're just going to get into a, a, a runner mechanic, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to teach someone how to run. It's innate in every single human. We just mm -hmm. know how to do it. Since you're a baby, you learn how to crawl, you learn how to walk, then you learn how to run. No one teaches you the proper way, right? You figure it out. Unless you're in track and you get hyper-specific, mm -hmm. no one's going to really teach it to you. Yeah. So even for a power lifter now, I've gone on runs with guys that lift, that lift, lift. And a lot of times they do get tense, right? Because their 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 limbs are just it's so much mass 
that their their joints aren't used to it. So I think the best thing would be go on a grass, go on turf, open up and just kind of build out some striders just to feel that. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can kind of get into details of like, all right, like this is where your foot's landing or, you know, can we now do it in a side to side motion or a backward motion, right? Just changing the muscles in the mind too, where it's like, you have to develop a different stimulus yeah. because now you're not coming from a lifting world. Most, most of those guys haven't been their Their body's not used to feeling that feeling of running side to side or mm -hmm. running backwards or running forward. So I would start there and then working through some mobility will definitely help because if their hips are super tight, it's going to get tight at mile two. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, I would say striders and actually going into more sprinting might be beneficial for someone like that. How about pushing a sled or something like that? Yeah, I think that too, right? Like mm -hmm. even running up a hill. Running up a hill is a mm -hmm. great way because naturally it forms, you're, you're going to work proper mechanics. Um, and I was telling Mark this earlier, the 100 up, which is literally for anyone, let alone a power lifter or, or just a general pop, like literally just being able to drive your knee up. Mm -hmm. This literally, they did this study on this doctor that didn't have time to train for marathons. Mm -hmm. All he had time for was in between patients. He would literally get 100 reps with each leg just bringing it up to uh, 90 degrees. Just like standing. Just and marching in place. Hmm. And then he then developed that into running in place. So the same thing, but now you're going at a mm. higher intensity yeah. and incorporating that little piece. So I think the mixture of sled work, of hills, of some striders, I would almost reverse it. If you want to run farther, let's focus on running faster right now and working on the proper mechanics. Mm. Um, we gotta we gotta bring this one in. I have a really important meeting that I have Ooh, to run to, okay. and I will uh -huh. have to come back and we'll have to kind of finish this. I apologize it's for that, good. but it's just circumstances uh, that I couldn't change uh, the schedule of some stuff. So Andrew, cool. take us on out of yeah. here, buddy. Well, so I guess we'll just be right back after a little bit, then, right? Yeah, something yeah. like that. Cool. All right, go. check out this ad and uh, see you guys in a few. Hey, Pat Roger family, shut your fucking mouth. No, not not really, but. Kinda. You should keep your mouth shut when you're asleep. Now on the podcast, we've been talking about the importance of nasal breathing for years. And we've been talking about using mouth tape during your sleep for years, as it's going to help your sleep quality because you're going to be breathing through your nose. We had James Nestor, author of Why We Sleep. Actually, that was Matthew Walker, but James Nestor, author of Breathe. We had Patch McEwen. Um, we've had so many people talk about the importance of taping your mouth and breathing through your nose when you sleep for your sleep quality, which helps your recovery, which helps every aspect of your health and fitness. So, Hostage tape. If you want to get some of this to help you sleep better, and it also stays on your face if you're a bearded man, which is one of the big problems with mouth tape, head to hostagetape.com slash power project. And there you can actually get the power project annual deal, which will give you a year supply of hostage tape, 55 cents a day for tape pretty much. And you'll be able to save $150 along with getting two tins, a year supply of tape and a blindfold. That is going to be something that you want to get your hands on. Links in the description, along with the podcast show notes. Shut your f***ing mouth. And we're back. We're back. All right. Round two, or round one. Uh, it's still round one. Yeah, it's, it's round, still one. round one. We just went for a quick bathroom break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a long... <laughs> that was, a really Dude, that was long my mile one. 16 shit break right there. <laughs> that, was <a> long, <laughs> that was a long poop. You gave us a lot of great information on running. I appreciate it. I hope so. Yeah, that's where we're at. You gave us a lot of great information on running. There was one thing, though. He... Mm -hmm. In our little shit break, he's talked about his breathing, and he breathes different from other runners, which is very, very interesting. Yeah, he goes, <gasps> <laughs> that. No, you were mentioning about the nasal breathing, and one thing I've heard from a lot of runners is some runners just don't give a fuck. They're like, oh, yeah, I'll breathe through my mouth. It doesn't really matter. You yeah. mentioned your coach, but how's it been for you? What have you noticed? Personally, I, I from doing Wim Hof a lot and just kind of understanding and how to like kind of calm down my personal body, it's been through the nose. Even on some faster tempos, my running coach is always like, breathe through the mouth, you'll get more oxygen in when you're going faster. Mm -hmm. But even for me, I've noticed that just going through the nose helps me. It's more comfortable. So naturally, I'll just go deep inhale and then slowly exhale it out, not like not utilizing so much energy. But I used to mix in different stuff and I was telling, like, we were just going like the double inhale. Mm-hmm. <sighs> So kind of mixing in just different breaths, like right. especially on easy runs. Like, first of all, if you're breathing through your mouth heavily, <sighs> you're probably running too fast at a volume or an intensity yeah. that's probably too, too much, right? Mm -hmm. So I would just say scale it back already. Um, you should be able to have a conversation with someone where you're then able to just breathe through your nose. But I would say for me, nasal breathing has helped tremendously from mouth breathing. Mm -hmm. Is it something you, did you implement it on purpose or did you just kind of come across it with the Wim Hof stuff? And Over time, I just came across it from the Wim Hof. Okay. So then I just started, I, I wanted to see if doing stuff in a stationary meditational practice 
translates into like an actual physical activity because mm. it's easy to it's easier to control your breath when you're laying on the floor and just meditating mm -hmm. and controlling on just your breath yeah. but now can you do that in, a, in an environment where your heart rate's up where you're doing physical physical activity so i kind of want to just take it from that world and then implement it into the actual running Makes have sense. you tried uh, nasal breathing only during I actually life? haven't, and we were talking about your the the mouth the hostage strength. tape. Yep. Yeah, so I haven't done that. I'm I would be intrigued. Yeah. It, when you post those videos, I'm like, shit, Mark looks crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and but is. it would be interesting. It would yeah. be very interesting. Yeah, it's not. It's uh, it's easy to get used to. Like it 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 might take a minute, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, at first you're a little bit like, mm, I'm not. but if you try it without the tape, you're going to end up cheating. Like mm -hmm. you're just going to be like, okay, well, every couple steps, <laughs> you know, every, you know, every other, I don't know, you're start to make shit up and yeah. you're, you're going to, you're going to cut corners and you're going to cheat. I would suggest trying it. I think it could be really beneficial. I'll look into that. It's going to keep your, it. keep your heart rate, uh, real modest. Do you, do you look at your heart rate? Do you watch a lot of this stuff or did you ever get into that? Almost like calorie counting. Like I know Enzima's mentioned how important calorie counting can be for somebody that's never dieted before because now they can start to have a look into like how many calories they're eating. And then over time, they could learn to do without actually calculating. Do you Have you looked at heart rates and stuff? Or I I've, I've look at heart rate, but remember we we're on the run talking about it. Like the, the watches are so inaccurate. Well, not so inaccurate, but they're off. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to gauge it. Like when I'm on an easy run, I know my heart rate's not at 165, 170, even though the watch says it is. So I've never actually gotten a heart rate monitor, which would be the best way to really track it accurately because you can connect it Bluetooth to your watch and you can see the actual number there. But a lot of it has been a feel thing where if I feel like I could have a conversation, if I feel like I'm not panting for for more air i know i'm at a good state we're looking at like just like at my pace itself are your coaches like pissed at you mm, not are so much like, actually. what are you doing how come you don't have because don't they want these numbers don't they mm. want these data points to really look at i mean personally my coach not as much i mean we have more of like a a very just conversational up-to-date like relationship where like we're like friends and then he's like my coach so like i'll just tell him like how a run went like specifically on harder workouts is where where he cares more because if he sets up like a six mile easy he just expects me to go super slow don't there should not be much thought into it it's just like go it's like brainless miles you know mm -hmm. but the harder workouts interval repeats fart licks tempo runs threshold workouts that's where he's like all right well how, how, how difficult was it and it's more of like that's the conversation versus like all right what was your heart rate at on rep four versus rep nine it was more like all right well like what's the rpe like the rate of perceived effort and mm -hmm. if you're in that like six to seven that means it's a good because it's a challenge but it's not daunting um and it's not too easy at, at the same time and if it's nine ten it's a problem because if i'm struggling to get through a workout mm -hmm. that's probably it's, it's it's too difficult for me for where my fitness is at at that moment so and he also might make modifications if you're like man my hip flexors you know are hurting for some reason i don't know what's going on 100 percent. it could be that the running is too intense and honestly we talked about it like even this past eight weeks i've probably been 70 percent on for my workouts which like the other 30% are like either me not completing them all the way or because of travel, having to adjust my, my routine. And I think when I heard this, the rule of thirds, where a third of your workouts are going to be like on point, you feel like I'm going to crush this marathon, crush this race, whatever. But then another third are going to be like solid. You got through them, right? Like they're good workouts. And another third are going to be like, fuck. I'm not ready. I, these, like, I felt like shit today, right? Yeah. Little self doubt. Exactly, right? So they, the, the rule of thirds is always there. And I think it's relatable in life too, as well, where it's like every day is not going to be great, exceptional, but there's going to be some good days, some bad days, some, mm -hmm. some solid days. And I think if you can stay even keel through those days, it makes the marathon prep a lot easier because marathon training is tough. It's like a full time job. Yeah. Mm. You're becoming more and more popular. Uh, your Instagram is growing. Your your social media is growing. Uh, you're getting more eyes on you. Get more um, more recognition. Um, how has that been? And like, uh, what happens in the comment section? Like, does this affect you negatively? Have you kind of gone down that rabbit hole? Do you click on the person that made the negative comment and like, mm -hmm. fuck the motherfucker's <laughs> private? Like, <laughs> you know, how how far down do you does this does this drag you down at all? Bother you at all? I mean. It's one, I'm super humbled at the fact that I've been able to grow an audience and people care enough mm. about what I'm doing that they're, they're, they're inclined to make a comment, whether it's positive or negative. It's super humbling. Um, 
for someone like me that is typically very positive and optimistic, it sucks seeing people that are like, oh, this guy's a fraud, this guy's X, Y, and Z. Like, of course that shit sucks. Like, who wants to hear that? Who wants to see it? But I think for me, it goes to a place of, these people don't really know who I am. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the people that give me love, they don't really know who I am either. So as long as like I know where my intent is and I know what I'm trying to do in this world, as long as that is positive and clear in my head, that for me is really what matters. Yeah. And the external stuff outside of all of that, besides my inner circle and my family, as long as those people that really know who Matt is, as long as they understand that I'm a high quality human, that's really my judgment of success. Mm -hmm. Less of like someone that has, a, whether they have a following or not, it's like, it's quite irrelevant because I might never see that person. Yeah. So I think any human, any influencer, any creator that's in this space, like you put yourself out there and you know that it's not gonna always be rah rah and, and, and good things mm -hmm. like you put yourself out there there's gonna be love there's gonna be hate as well so i think i've i would rather the hate not happen but i understand that it's just part of the game mm -hmm. and it's just a matter of how you can actually handle it internally why are people calling you a fraud what's going on is <laughs> this this new drama that that got yeah, I mean, drummed up recently 100 percent. i mean we, let's let's just chat about it now i mean so i ran in the houston marathon on sunday mm -hmm. and by the time i tried to sign up for my bib registration was closed and in the past, I've gotten into races. What's a bib? <laughs> <laughs> a bib is just like uh, the actual like placement. It's you registering for a powerlifting competition. A number that they give the you in the race. The number that they give you, exactly. And it's basically verifying that you signed up and you did the proper steps to get Got into it. this challenge, race or whatever. So I tried to get my bib a couple weeks ago. And typically in, in some races, you can get a bib 24 hours before a race because they're not sold out. And at the end of the day, these races and marathons, they want a profit. They want to sell out as many quote unquote bibs or registrations as possible because it's a moneymaker. Mm -hmm. But Houston, did they sold out of bibs in like January, like the end of December maybe. Yeah. So by the time I tried to get one, it was too late. So then I kind of went into the mode of like, all right, shoot. Like I made a human error. Like I should have paid attention more and gotten this earlier, but I didn't. So now my mind goes to a place where it's like, all right, what do I do now? Like I can either just say, screw this race. I've just been training, but not run it or reach out and find people that might have a, a extra bib in that case. Mm -hmm. So I've reached out to one of my buddies, James Rowe, who, who has a run club in Atlanta called ARC. And I just asked, I'm like, yo, does anyone in the club have an extra bib that they're not going to use? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, we got three extra bibs. I'm like, shit. I was like, dude. So that means these people aren't actually running in the race. Exactly. I mean, so this stuff happens quite often, right? Like if you're training for something and something pops up and you twist your ankle or you get hurt or life happens, you have to go to a wedding or, or whatever, someone might not run a race that they bought a ticket for, bought a bib for. Mm. So the race, the marathon, they get to just pocket that money and there's a, one less person that's running. So for me, I was just like, I thought of it as like a no harm, no, harm, no foul. Like, like, let me just like, get a bib. And it, I, obviously I couldn't transfer my name because Houston just doesn't allow transfers of bibs. Mm -hmm. Other races do. So if, if I was running in New York and for some reason I couldn't, I could be like, yo, Mark's gonna go run for me, right? And like, that's, it's, it's happened in the past. Yeah. Um, long story short, I end up doing that. I go through that process. I don't transfer the bib over, but I run the race under someone else's bib someone else's name. So technically Matt Choi didn't register for this race. So I was running in this terminology as a bib mule. And I didn't even know that was the thing. <laughs> what is a bib mule? So a bib mule, I guess from the article that, that had gotten written about me was basically someone who runs under someone else's name uh -huh. in the goal of like trying to qualify for a race or trying to get in for free or whatever it is. Like however you want to like contextualize it. Um, the intent was not in that fashion. I just wanted to run just to see what I can get as a personal time. The dude that I ran for had no intent to run Boston. Like he just, he, this was just another thing that he just had signed up for. So it's unfortunate. And I think in moments like this, it's like, you know, it's a test of character as well, right? Like I know there's, I, 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 I fucked up by not buying one. And that's on me and I can take ownership for that. It's unfortunate how far social media can go where it just becomes a negative thing. And mm. everyone assumes the worst, right? It's like, oh my God, this guy is an influencer. He's in the space. And now he's trying to take away from the running community, right? Mm. And it's like, I feel like all of my actions before this have been the total opposite. It's been only to like bring value or bring more eyes to the running community because of what it's done for me, right? Like running's changed my life more so than honestly football in that sense, which is crazy to think about since I've only been running for two years, you know? So Whew. it's unfortunate mm -hmm. that that had happened and I got to take ownership for, for, for my actions. And 
it's a good learning lesson for me moving forward that like I can't just take things so lightly. Like that's always been my mindset. Like it's not that the end of the world. Like like Mark, I'm just using someone's bib. It's not like I'm trying to cheat or I'm, mm-hmm. I'm trying like you know. So for me, there was no malicious intent. But obviously, from the outside looking in, people are gonna have their skept- uh, skept- skepticism or assumption on what happened. So for me, it's like now I got to understand that I have to dot my eyes and cross my t's better and cover my own ass in that sense. You gotta also think, if you were trying to be purposefully a bib mule, why would you film the whole marathon? <laughs> yeah. Like, hey, mile one, mile two, all the way to mile 26, yeah. that's not a very secretive bib mule. You weren't 100%. hiding it. Yeah. And I mean, dude, and I've been making content around the Houston Marathon. Like, and I, I always do these preps where it's, I'm bringing the people along with me, right? Where it's like, hey, I'm five weeks out from the race, four weeks out from the race. I think for me, just like life's been, you know, happening so fast where I just forgot to sign up. Yeah. And like, honestly, p- people that actually know me, like they, this is like normal behavior where I'll, like, I literally got my hotel ticket for Sacramento yesterday when I landed in ah! Sacramento. <laughs> like the, that type of shit is just how I operate as like, an entrepreneur, as a human. Like, We're the same. Exactly. I don't stress. <laughs> I don't stress about like the, the minute details. And I know that in this scenario, like it's bigger than just the details. Cause you know, now it's like my image and the brands I work with. And it is unfortunate because, you know, it is self-inflicting in that sense, but I'm fully taking ownership for it, right? It's like, I'm not trying to point the finger and be like, oh my God, like, I can't believe this is happening to me. Woe is me mentality. I'm almost trying to figure out like, what's the best way to kind of deal with this type of negative backlash, you know? Mm. Cause it is like, it's, I'm crossing into a field now where it is different. Cause most of my shit's been so positive. People have been getting like impacted in their lives. And I'm just like, damn, now someone is taking a story into their own way and people are hearing it and they're making their own assumptions like, oh my God, I can't believe this. Mm. And I'm just like, damn, it's just, mm. it's, it's unfortunate. Yeah. The, the truth is that you uh, maybe are a little laxed and irresponsible and that's about it. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same, last time I went to Austin, Texas, I uh, didn't uh, book a hotel. A lot of times my wife handles stuff like that for me, so I wasn't <laughs> even really thinking about it. And then I got there and I'm like, I don't have any like hotel information. And then I was like, well, I was like, I'm not going to worry about it. I'll just go. I'll just have a, a, a Uber take me to like a hotel in Austin, you know? And so I asked the Uber just to take me to like a nice hotel, like in, in Austin. And they dropped me off. I walked in and I just, I got a room yeah. and you know, my wife, uh, she called me later and she's like, she's like, how'd you end up getting a room or like what? I was like, I don't know. I just drove to the same hotel that I went to last time. And I, was like, I walked in and I got a room. <laughs> She's like, oh my God, that's so lucky. <laughs> like that's, right? that's kind of, yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of how I roll a lot of times. And I, yeah, I was fortunate. I didn't have to go to like seven mm-hmm. different hotels or wasn't some major convention going on there, but I do that kind of shit all the time. I wait till the last minute on a lot of stuff. Yeah, you're, you're also in the Boston Marathon. <laughs> like you're about to go to the Boston Marathon yeah. too. Well, I'm running with his bib. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you were his bib mule. Uh, I was the bib mule. Yeah. God Guys, it. that's a fucking joke. <laughs> of course, someone makes an article for I utilized that. his time to qualify. Yeah. Oh, sub three. Uh, Good yeah, job, yeah. Mark. Way to go, <laughs> Mark. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you whatever way I can. <laughs> hey, some people uh, earn it and some people just pay for it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> But you still earned it because you had to earn that money. That's right. Yeah. Sold a lot of slingshots for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, uh, uh, do you, what's happening with this? Like, are you going to, do you know if you'll be able to run Boston? Because it was, I mean, you weren't trying to be a bib wheel, yeah. right? But your time did qualify for Boston. Yeah. So, I mean, I already qualified. So, th- I was what ha- say your times are already super fast. So, I'd imagine you qualified anyway. Yeah. So, I qualified oh, for go. Boston four months ago, five months ago in the Tunnel Vision Marathon, right? Okay. And what happens in Boston is you have to qualify before the cutoff date, which is November of the year prior to the race. So, I had to get a qualifying time before November 2022 to get accepted for Boston April of 2023. Ah. So, even the time I just posted for this guy, Eric Lee, um, in January 15th of 23, that's technically a qualifying time for Boston 24. So it doesn't even impact it for this year. So I think, yes, I mean, that that time is DQ'd now. Like there's no qualifying time for that. But yeah. I already qualified five months ago when I ran Tunnel Vision. So if there's repercussions now where, oh, because I did this, that they don't allow me to run this year, I mean, that would be super unfortunate, but I don't see that happening. Yeah. Um, it's just DQ'd for 24 for mm. that guy. Yeah. Uh, so just like fishing for things like for why like this article was written the way it was like why did the guy who bought the bib why did he back out of the uh, marathon yeah so he he lives in Atlanta and just like couldn't make it 
So he had like an injury a couple weeks ago. So he just was like, I'm not going to run the race. Mm -hmm. So he just didn't go. So it was literally just an extra bib. Yeah. It yeah. happened that he's also Asian too. He's, his name's Eric Lee. So I was like, my buddy James was like, at least it's like, at least that's a little bit better. Like at least it wasn't like a Caucasian name or like, like something outlandish. But yeah, the guy basically was injured. So he didn't run the race. You know, it would have actually been better if it wasn't an Asian guy yeah, because now they're like, oh, he's trying to impersonate Eric Lee. If it was at least like maybe a six, five black dude or something, it would have been better, you know, but you just fucked yourself. Saying that. Oh my God. Oh man. Oh. That's too fucking funny. Yeah, and, and so, so that's what it is. And, and so, like, how often does this happen, though? Like, when somebody will buy a bib and then they can't do it and they can't transfer the name. Like, how often does somebody technically become a mule for somebody else? I mean, that I just, I don't know the exact answer. What I do know is I'm sure it's very common that yeah. someone runs under a different name, just takes a bib, right? Like, mm. but you got to think, like, for me, I'm, I'm on socials. Like, I'm on, I'm on, I make a bunch of content. If I made zero videos, no one would have really known, right? Mm -hmm. But- the fact that I'm obviously out there and putting it out there, it made it a very a easy target for myself. Yeah. But I'm sure that this happens all the time. I mean, people get into races, people, things happen in life and no one wants to waste a hundred dollar, $250, whatever the ticket mm -hmm. to get into a race is. Um, if someone else is willing to run it, it would just benefit the race for more people to be there, you know? Yeah. So I'm not, I don't know the exact answer. Mm -hmm. Clearly it's enough for this guy to have a whole blog around marathon investigation <laughs> because it's happened in the past. And honestly, someone wrote in the comments, like Matt's new to running and this guy, Derek's been around in the space and he's found a bunch of other people um, that have done similar things, obviously, because this is a whole, this is a proper business. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's not in, I really don't know how often it happens, mm -hmm. but I'm sure it's it's happening quite. I'm sure I wasn't the only one in Houston that did that or used someone else's bib. Maybe not as a mule, but you just using someone's bib. Why would it be like looked down upon? Like what's the, is there an advantage of? Well, I mean, obviously if you have someone that, you know, is capable of running faster that runs for you to get into a historic race, that mm -hmm. would be a problem, right? That's And that's yes. what's happening. Mm -hmm. So I have- well, I, somebody, uh, so you wearing this other guy's bib and getting a certain time recorded, and then he gets into that race that way. Exactly, where which it wasn't technically earned because it's him. like uh, the thing is like um, it's like chipped, right? It has a chip in exactly. it. A lot of the bib has a chip in it, right? That tells you your time, and it's associated to your name. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, and there's thousands of. I get it. There's yeah. thousands of people running. It's not like there's like 10 people running. There's mm -hmm. thousands of people sometimes running in these races. Yeah. And obviously the Boston Marathon too, right? Getting a sub three hour marathon is like a goal that some people have for their whole lives. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. for that to happen, it's like, shoot, even for me, it took me four marathons to qualify for Boston. Right. It's like, it's like, it's an achievement that is not just for the faint Holy of heart. Shit. Right. So it's like people work their whole lives to do it. And I understand why these people, like why this person would make such a negative article about it. But the fact that like the intent was not in that fashion, mm -hmm. right? And like, I think that's just on me to maybe clarify that as well, where it's like, I just personally wanted to run the Houston Marathon because I had trained for it and I wanted to see what time I could get, right? For me, I had already qualified for Boston, but I mean, it makes sense from the outside looking in of someone being like, oh my God, this guy's trying to take advantage and run for someone, you know? You know, I'm not in the running space, so I don't give a fuck <laughs> about saying this, but I, you know, you're, you're like, some people work their whole lives to do sub three and I did it in, in four, four marathons. <laughs> Number one, I know you were being cool. I know you weren't even trying to sound like that, but I'm just like, man, I could see this this writer dude seeing your Instagram Steaming. and you're like, he has a hundred and something thousand followers. He has a big ass TikTok and YouTube and he just fucking, he got into the Boston fuck this dude and then just goes in because like oh he, angry <laughs> a little TMZ ass gun, little fucking gremlin dude fuck you seriously I'm not in the space so I don't care it doesn't matter <laughs> come after me motherfucker <laughs> oh god that's funny yeah this, I said this not Matt <laughs> no, yeah <laughs> Yeah, if it was up to him, Matt would probably be like, don't say that. Yeah. But hey, he's a grown man right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, who's going to stop him? <laughs> Not I. Oh, man. Oh. Yeah, because I'm, I'm just, I'm going through the article and I'm trying to understand like why he is writing so mad. And like one of the things that's making me laugh now is, um, to, uh, quoting to be clear in either case, the runner is stealing by taking advantage of a service that they did not pay for. 
just going to ask, did you pay the, the person back for the bib? Yeah, I mean, I paid him. Yeah, it was just funny because he, like, he was like, because I know he was like, your Venmo. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll have to pull up the Venmo. He was like, yo, we should make a joke saying that, that I paid you 100000 to go fucking run a sub three for me. Uh. And I was like, that's the last thing we need to do. Yeah. But yes, I mean, I paid him for the bib, which was $150. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I did enough homework where I was reaching out and talking to the Houston Marathon like, hey, can we do this? Like, can we transfer it? If not, I'll fund, I'll put money in for a fundraiser, but mm-hmm. even all the fundraisers were closed. So mm. at that point when they, the Houston Marathon pretty much gave me Matt, there's no other option for you. And instantly in my mode, I just went into a problem solving mode. I'm like, well, all right, well, is it the end of the world if I use someone else's bib? And in my mind, I was like, it's, it shouldn't be. Mm. And obviously this backlash happened like 48 hours after the race. So mm. now I'm just like, all right, well, I'm trying to handle that situation and obviously understand like I want to still push out content from the race, but now it's just so many people are being negative where it's just like, is it even worth? And Mm -hmm. I'm having people in my community that are like, that are heavy runners that are like, dude, I've done this before. I've literally had like my (laughs) father passed away and I ended up using his bib or like all these elaborate stories and people are sending me some thoughtful messages, which, you know, it's awesome to hear. But at the end of the day, there's still a few select people that are like, this guy's an asshole. He's, I can't believe he's corrupting the system, the running community. And Mm. I'm thinking like, damn, like for, for people like me that aren't runners their whole lives, yeah. I'm getting into the sport and trying to like get ingrained into the community, not in a like malicious way, right? Not in a way just for, for me to get dollars. It's less of that. I do most of these races for myself to just challenge myself, mm-hmm. right? It's not because I get mm-hmm. to work with these brands, X, Y, and Z. Obviously, that's been a part of my business and how I've grown my community, but I got into running because it was something that taught me patience. It taught me something about delayed gratification and how to really put your time and effort into something to then turn it into something meaningful and that's kind of been my whole journey the past couple years of running and when this stuff happens it's like i can see why other people are like looking from the outside in like damn i don't want to be part of the fucking running community shit someone Mm. takes someone's bib and then that becomes a (laughs) scandal or a cheater it's like shit if my buddy dev told me someone he's like dude if you started at mile 10 and like weaseled your way in to then get a fast time that would be something different but mm-hmm. i started with the pack that happens yeah. I, and i'm sure it happens all the time but i started with the pack i did everything logistically the same besides signing up early enough and yeah. that's totally on me and i gotta take ownership for that and and so when you did start reaching out trying to find a bib uh the people that you reached out to have they been in the running community longer and did any of them stop and say dude whoa you can't do this mm-hmm. like did any of them say like oh you better be careful no, so the no, no, so I didn't really have that heads up, and this mm-hmm. is the first time I've really even been in this angle of like, shit, I forgot to sign up. Like most races, I'm already signed up, I'm ready to roll, you know. Mm, yeah. So this was like I was a kind of an unknown territory in that sense, and yeah, I guess I just didn't have that guidance. I even asked my running coach. I was like, dude, I forgot to sign up for my bid, and he was like, one of his athletes did the same exact thing, and I mm. asked him, I'm like, dude, and he never had mentioned like this. This would be the backlash because I don't even think he thought it. Like he's been in the running space for a while where like this exchange of bibs or transfer of bibs or whatever, it's not like a, I don't, I don't think it's like an unknown thing. Mm. I think it's also mm. just cause like you have eyes on you that I think that that seems yeah. to be the big thing. It's like you have a big following, you know, mm-hmm. you've, you've grown and running fairly quickly. So everything you do is going to be seen. There's probably a lot of people who are doing this and they're doing it with malicious intent, right. except no one they're not seen, you yeah. know, and that just seems to be very, that's very unfortunate, man. Yeah. That's just unfortunate. Yeah. And what I was getting at, it was like, even though people are upset that you are fairly new, it's not like you ran out there and like tackled somebody, took their bib and be like, yep, I'm new. So it's okay. Like, no, you went around, you asked, you didn't find that bib on your own, right? Like you asked people yeah, and those people knew about running and they've been in it longer than you. And nobody stopped and said, no, you can't do this. Yeah. You know, every, somebody would have thrown up a huge red flag if it was going to lead to all this. I couldn't agree more. And now it's like, for me now, I have such a heightened level of awareness around this specific topic where if someone was in this steering around this area and they have some form of an audience or following, I would strictly steer them. It's not even worth it. Just Mm -hmm. like use your training for the next race because honestly, if at the worst case scenario, I like get dropped by all of my brands, like that would be the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. Like that would suck, right? Like I could still overcome that, but like that would just be shitty. Um, And it's not worth it just to get a time, right? Even though I had no malicious intent for this, it's just like, it wouldn't be worth the the amount of like suffering that you'd have to go through to then Mm -hmm. just run a marathon. Mm -hmm. At that point, I would just freaking ran the marathon afterwards and been like, all right, 
everyone's you guys all go and then I could just run mm -hmm. the course and let me just go run, you yeah. know? Yeah. A lot of times uh people will point out, especially like distance runners, um, especially ultra runners in particular, they'll say uh, a lot of those people have some mental health issues that they're mm. dealing with and they're going to run it off. And a lot of uh, a lot of ultra runners have kind of verified that. They're like, yeah, I'm, mm -hmm. I've got a couple screws loose and it helps me <laughs> when I fucking go really, really far. I, I get to go into myself. I get to go inward. Um, do you feel any of that? Like, what do you think is driving you? Uh, because it takes a lot, you yeah. know, to run like sub seven minute miles, mile after mile after mile. Mm -hmm. Um, it's different than just going out there on a brisk jog of and course. being like, oh, I worked up a good sweat. Yeah. <laughs> it's way different uh, doing what you're doing. It's kind of, it, it feels and looks to the outside, uh, it, it looks punishing. It looks oh, brutal. Yeah. It looks tough. So what are you experiencing and what is running doing for you? I mean, I think running, to answer your question directly, I think there is a little mental health piece for, for me. Like, as a former football player, like my identity was so caught up in football. Mm -hmm. When I had that, when that was eliminated, I kind of got into corporate America. Like I didn't know like who I was as a human. Like I only, like for such a long time, football was like, I could use it as like my, my armor, mm -hmm. right? That was like my shield of like, oh, worst comes to worst. Matt Choi's a football player. He's an athlete. I could always use that as like kind of like my armor in that sense. And once that got eliminated, I kind of went through my own form of like, you know, like whether it's seasonal depression or some form of a depression of like under, like not knowing who I was yeah, and that, that not understanding of self in that sense. And I think when I got into running first, it was, oh shit, like this is just uncomfortable for me. It's challenging. And I just wanted to lean into that, right? That curiosity of like, oh shit, this is something I don't love to do, but can I be disciplined enough to form this into actually like a habit and a routine? But once that over, like I overcame that, right? And I got into running. I'm like, all right, I got better at this. Then it just became my form of solitude, to your point, to work through some of those mental demons. I don't really listen to music when I go on runs, right? Like I'm just kind of in my own self, my own thoughts. And I always tell people, like, people are like, what are you, what's your why, X, Y, and Z? And like, I feel like my why has been understanding self much better. And I think so many people, like, they, they can't get in their own ears and understand who they are as a human and they want the validation of so many external things. For me, I get so clear when I'm on runs or I'm doing challenges where I just have space to be in myself. Mm -hmm. People look at me, they're like, Matt, you're like extroverted. Like, I can't imagine you being like an introverted guy. But in reality, I'm actually more introverted than I am extroverted. And it's those moments where I'm in my own solitude. I like, I'm very comfortable in those spaces. Equally in these environments where I'm able to really showcase my energy and be myself, but I think my ability to be introverted and enjoy the solitude is the reason I can show up for other people, yeah. whether it's on social, in person, in real life, whatever it is. So running has allowed me to have that space where I can do something physical, get that result for myself, like my body in that sense. In addition to the mental aspect of like, shit, there's always that battle against yourself. And I, when Goggins talked about that accountability mirror, I really like resonated with that shit where it's like, at the end of the day, there's no one else that you're really battling with, right? Mm -hmm. If you can't win the battle against the person you see in the mirror, then you're already losing. So even when this shit happens to me, it's like, I know that I'm fully in control, that I, I'm in control of how I react or how I don't react. And as long as I'm in peace with my own mind, I can't allow all these external things to like dictate who I am as a person because I know that it's not true. You know, and even though I know I fucked up, like that article is not a representation of who I am as a person. Yeah. And it sucks that they're steering that message for it to be that way. And that's on me to now clarify and, and open up and talk about that it was a mistake on my end, right? Mm -hmm. But I think to answer your question, Mark, like there's definitely a mental health aspect to that too, where I really found the enjoyment of the solitude and running that it provides me both mentally and physically. Mm. So you look at running, even though you're expending a fuck ton of energy, you look at that shit as a recharge for yourself. It pretty much is. Like, that's like, I can't see my days getting started almost without it now, you mm -hmm. know? And like that amount of, like, it's like a meditation state, right? When you're in flow state, like yeah. on some of these easy runs, and I'm sure you're starting to feel this too, Mark, where it's like, shit, like seven, eight miles in, even today when we were chatting, like I didn't, I felt like time was going so slow. You know, we were just like flowing and just, we were just having awesome conversation. And I feel like I'm able to create that almost every day with my life. Like every I was day. Uh, crying on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> like, this guy's really fat. No, he, he went at a comfortable pace. I, I was lucky that he didn't <laughs> drag me out in the deep water. Oh, man. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's definitely a form of like that meditation and, and, and solitude in that sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the really amazing things about running. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why you love it so much, because Absolutely. as much as we love the gym, it's just you can put on a pair of shoes and if you can build the skill, mm -hmm. which 
will just take some repetition. That is a free way for you to just go out, clear your mind, feel good for the day, and it, it just takes a pair of shoes. Yeah. Power Project family, how's it going? I want to talk to you guys about the best gym fits in the game. You need to head over to Viore. People don't know how to spell, say it. People don't know how to spell it. V-U-O-R-I. But let me tell you something about Viore. They have great clothes that you can wear outside the gym, weddings, lunches, dates. And then they have, <laughs> they have great pieces of equipment you can wear in the gym that make you look good while you're lifting. Because I know there's still a lot of y'all who are still rocking and one shorts. And <laughs> although yeah. I have nothing against and one. It gets me every time. I have nothing against and one shorts. Yeah. Honestly, it looks horrible. So Andrew, <laughs> please tell the people how to step up their damn clothing game. <laughs> For real, you guys got to step up. Head over to viori.com slash power project. That's V-U-O-R-I.com slash power project to receive 20% off your order. Uh, no code needed. You guys will see a uh, discount will be applied at checkout banner across the top. Uh, links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. It feels amazing. And, and just going through and reflecting on your thoughts. I think that... Uh, to some extent, I think some walking can do some of that, but oh, walking's yeah. not walking in the beginning for some people might be challenging enough. And if there's hills and stuff, it might be challenging enough. But I think you need to move a little faster uh, because I do think that there's something to uh, just exerting yourself, uh, deep breathing. Um, you should be getting rid of a lot of energy. Um, a lot of men really crave, uh, they have a lot of sexual cravings. They have a lot of food, cra they've got a lot of cravings going on Yeah, uh, to be <laughs> reckless and fucking devious and to go against the things that we say that we want to do uh, versus, uh, you know, some of the, or the things that we kind of like feel like we need to do to build character, to be stronger, to be a better person, to show up better for people. Uh, but then there's like a lot of stuff that we want to do that creeps in there, uh, eating bad food, uh, sexual desires and so forth. But if you exhaust yourself every day and you're spent, <laughs> you kind of blew your wad already. <laughs> yeah. And not that you still won't be interested in those things. It's just uh, maybe you're not, uh, I don't know, searching around for them quite as much it's not as overpowering <laughs> yeah it can feel overpowering good word truly no, i love that no i think i think you're spot on <laughs> i think you're spot on with that when you're um when you have been improving with with your times and stuff i mean when you're finishing these races like sub three minute or sub three hour uh marathons uh mm -hmm. what's been your what's been your improvement and when you finish are you kind of like are you kind of dying when you finish or like, are you just, you know, getting across the finish line and like breathing really hard or mm. because the intensity of a marathon or half marathon for a lot of people uh, that aren't moving really fast, the intensity is kind of low, yeah. but does it look different because you're kind of, you're actually like racing. Yeah. I think in Houston, it was one of the first times where I was like exhausted. Just like my body had just like, I think the humidity and the heat really played a part it was the first time in a race where my last two miles weren't the fastest split, fastest splits. Mm. Most marathons I've done, I have enough juice in the tank to like grind out that last mile to really like push it. And even if it's like a 10 second, 15 second faster split, like that's something that if Big you have deal, enough, yeah. right, if you have, if you have enough energy to run your last, tw your 26th mile faster than your first, like that, that's impressive, you know? And this was the first time where I felt like I, if I try to use more energy, if I try to use more power through the ground by pushing off the ground, that I was going to catch a cramp. Mm -hmm. And I think the heat, how much I was sweating through miles 13 through 22, it's just like I kind of lost a, a, some of my extra juice at the end. And it was the first time where, like, even though Houston is relatively a flat course, they actually had some rolling hills in the, in the, in the uh, back 10K mm -hmm. where it's just like it's depleting when you're like facing a hill. And this is like the mixture of the hydration, but it's depleting when you're facing a hill and you're trying to like, go up and like really conserve mm -hmm. some energy. So I think this race, and if you look right here, this is right around mile 21, 22, like even my form, it starts to get broken down right here. And you could just tell that I'm like, and obviously I'm going through a water station, but I'm not as efficient as I was even in the first clip of this exact video. And you could just like, look at the energy. Like I just, I look like I'm smoother right here in this gate pattern. Mm -hmm. And this is at mile like three to four. So obviously in a marathon, it's a very long I race. See, yeah. yeah. And this, this one specifically, I was much slower at the very end, but I'm not out of breath panting. It's more just the legs are just torched. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I wasn't coming in like, <sighs> <sighs> it was more just like, 
the legs felt depleted, like they didn't have that much juice left. What's been your improvement from Marathon 1 versus Marathon 4? Mm. Marathon 1 on my 26th birthday in 2021 was a 355 marathon. This was with no coach. I was training during COVID, just out of my mom's place doing research on Google. Then from 355, I did a 100-mile race. Then I did a, the 100-miler. So yeah. yeah, that's like obviously a complete different training grounds, but that mental fortitude of like what I gained mentally by completing that hundred miler, it then allowed me to get back into marathon training. I then ran the Philly marathon in 2022. Um, and I ran a 308. So I was super close. That's like a huge on, yeah, on wow. the, and, and that was like not even with a coach. Mm. I didn't get a coach until I hit sub three four or five months ago. So, so you hit sub three without a coach. No, 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 I didn't. I oh, didn't hit didn't. sub three. Okay, I, I was yeah. close though. So that was a 308 in Philly. Mm -hmm. And then four months later, I ran in Austin and I ran a 305. All right. So shaved a little bit off again. And it wasn't until I worked with Jeff Cunningham, um, who's Nick Bear's coach. Then I got to a 257. And that was with dedicated marathon training and yeah. a proper build, a 16, uh, a 16 week build. And then I hit 257 in, um, in August of 2022. So that was my fastest marathon to date. And then I did New York City for fun. And then I just recently did Houston, which was 259 mm. or technically not. And how did you <laughs> learn about how to run uh, when you didn't have a coach? Because those are impressive times anyway. So you must have known something. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big practitioner. And I think that's where a lot of people kind of misstep when they start to educate themselves on certain stuff. It's easy to listen to a podcast like this or read a mm -hmm. book, right? From that point, you need to take some action and you need to start executing on something. Whether it's right or wrong, you mm -hmm. got to do something though, right? And Mark, that's been my journey. Like I would listen to Nick Bear or hear David Goggins' story or see how Jesse Itzler finished a 50, 100 mile race. And I'd be thinking to myself like, what separates these people apart? Yeah. It's not much. It's just the discipline of doing the work every day and showing up, right? Mm -hmm. So I just kept showing up. Like, and that's been my journey of life. It's just showing up every day and trying to get a little bit better, get a little bit smarter to then use the knowledge and put it into practice. And mm. from there, the 309 to 308, I was battling injuries still through that time, trying to figure out my system and my body. So um, I think that's been the biggest thing is just being a practitioner. It's doing the education, doing the homework, but then applying that homework, right? I was telling it in Simba, like I sucked at school. I cheated on everything. I was the worst student. And being Asian, that's not the best thing to <laughs> tell your mother. And it's just like school though, right? Like you get taught something and then you need to go apply that knowledge, right? I yeah. never did that through school really. So then when I applied it into football or different activities I had really big passions into, it then started to come into fruition. Mm -hmm. I was like, damn, I put all that time into football and I got a college scholarship. Like that's an awesome thing. Imagine you do that in anything, in business, in relationships, in life, mm -hmm. like you'll get that return. It's just a matter of patience. Were your parents supportive of uh, you being somebody that, had dreams of doing things in football and these other kind of hopes and dreams, or did they want to see you go uh, more of like a traditional route? Yeah. Traditional route. I mean, my parents were split when I was super young. So like I've always grown up mm. with my mom and like my dad's been in my life, but like not enough to like give me the say to be like, you, you shouldn't do this or do that. Right. My mom, I think once she saw me earn a college scholarship, she realized like, Oh shoot. Matt's not going to go down your typical path of like being really good at school and earning a, um, a, a educational scholarship and X, Y, and Z, right? Like I had no aspiration to be a doctor or a lawyer or she never forced that on me and my brother. So mm -hmm. I, I got super fortunate with the way I grew up. My mom instilled a ton of self-esteem in my mind where I just became confident in who I am as a person and utilizing my strengths. Like mm -hmm. She saw me do well in football. She always understood that that was going to be um, the driving force to also show up in school, maybe not be a straight A student, but just show up enough, get A's and B's, get some C's and try not to fail out in any classes. Um, but then as I got into the creator space and just kind of being an entrepreneur and just building my own business, I think my mom, she's gotten, she's very Americanized, right? She's worked in a bunch of fortune 500 companies. So she understands mm. that working up the corporate ladder is also not as sexy as it sounds. Mm. Being a C-suite in a big company, yes, you get a fat paycheck on a yearly salary, but your time is so restricted. You have no freedom. Yeah. So my mom instilled me early. She's like, look at all these entrepreneurs, Mark Cuban, Gary Vee, all these guys, like, really what they have, they have money and they have cars and they have houses, but they have freedom, right? Freedom is the game that people want. 
Just like how time is the one thing that doesn't stop, right? But most people want freedom in life. And they think it comes in a monetary form and it, it definitely helps to have money. But freedom itself is creating a lifestyle where you can design your own, design how it looks for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, money will buy you a lot of time. It does. That's a fact. Dude. What's the business that you're that you're in? What are you, uh, you you're doing? You're helping people with like branding, uh, marketing, and, and things mm -hmm. like that. Yes, I mean, basically, what I've been able to develop with my own personal brand when it came through a lot of it through social media, right? Just understanding where attention is, mm -hmm. understanding how you can, as a business, implement content into your guys's like marketing strategy. So we work with a lot of brands in the health and wellness space, like trying to figure out, all right, well, if they're doing really well on on one platform. How come they're not doing so well on a different one? And just kind of coming up with different creative strategies where it's implementing very similar content, but making it contextual to the platform because you're understanding who's on that platform, right? Like people on TikTok are consuming content differently than they do on Facebook, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, or on YouTube. Yeah. And it's understanding that. But for someone that's just operating a business, they, they're not in the weeds of social, right? So I basically just took the trade and the skill sets of building it for myself and helping other brands and entrepreneurs do the same for them. Mm. Um, it's a very rewarding space because I'm confident in, 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 in talking about it because I've done it myself. And for me, it's just very tried and true. Most people want the results so fast, just like getting a six pack or growing your glutes. Like everyone wants like 30 day, 60 day <laughs> program. And are you sure you're going to guarantee growth in 90 days? And honestly, most times I say, I'm not sure actually. It depends on how good you are at making content mm -hmm. and how contextual you can actually be because there's a level of skill when it comes to content creating, just like any professional sport. Yeah. I'm, I'm a firm believer that content creating or creating in general is almost becoming like the new athlete. You need to have a mindset to be this person. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's just like any, any athlete, any successful athlete. Yeah, it takes a lot of time. It does. In terms of learning this stuff, because you've created a business around it, did, did, you fin did school help you with this or like did, did it help propel you towards this? Or For what sure. was it? I mean, I, so I studied marketing and management in, in, in school. So okay. business was, I had an understanding that I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I wanted to study business and just kind of figure it out from there, right? Mm -hmm. Most people that get into business typically just get like an, a, 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 a BM degree or whatever it is, something communications, like something basic, and you kind of figure it out as you go. Um, I took a couple social media classes and things of that sort, but the stuff that, that professors were teaching were like, was outdated. Like they were talking about email campaigns and which mm -hmm. is still great. Um, and TV ads and billboards. And I'm like, that's old school. Right. So as I, after I got out of uh, school, I started consuming a ton of Gary V mm -hmm. <laughs> and Gary V has been a big psychology and mindset shift. In addition to the marketing, his tactics are tried and true. Yeah. So I consumed a shit ton of his content, which then helped me build my business for myself. In addition to helping other people kind of figure out how they can do it for them. Mm -hmm. What do you think are some of the differences between some of these social media platforms? Like say the difference between Instagram uh, versus TikTok, like why might something, you know, work and explode and do really well on Instagram and then not do well on TikTok? Yeah. I think the biggest thing is the person that's consuming it, right? You know, when TikTok first came out, it was a lot younger. It steered younger where everyone was dancing and, and doing those little trends and, and things of that sort, which was super cool and fun. It draws a lot of eyes, right? Because it's entertaining. Yeah. Um, I think someone on, uh, on, on Instagram or on LinkedIn, they're in a different mode of consumption. When you go on LinkedIn, you're thinking more business, like, right? Like, oh, I need to connect with someone or I want to get taught something or, or educational, whatever it is, versus on Instagram, you just want to like, you want to release some time, right? Like you just like, you're just like kind of in dead zone. You're watching TV maybe and you're just like, all right, let me, let's see what's happening on Instagram. So I think the mode of, communication on every platform is a little bit different and how you actually can resonate with your audience is a little different and so doing small things where I think on TikTok right now, doing more authentic, like just camera to face posts where you're just being very authentic and being you is a better formula than doing that on Instagram, mm -hmm. where on Instagram you can make, you know, use using a camera or using higher quality equipment to make it look super cinematic and things of that sort. So I think people on TikTok are more consumed into the person, right? Who are you as a human? And that's why a lot of people, they just say, oh, they'll do, like, girls will do get ready with me. And they'll go on their spiel of like what they got for the rest of the day. Or guys will be like, yo, let's, let's do a mic'd up lift session. Yeah. And people like that content because it's personal, right? It's kind of like a, it's kind of like why YouTube does well. YouTube long form content is as personal as you're going to get with someone, mm -hmm. right? Because they're not editing as much, they're not cutting as many clips, but Mark, Mark could be exactly who he is everyday life. And those TikTok videos are very similar to that, but in one minute to two minutes. So mm. I think each platform just has a different way that people consume on it. So making content specific to it is important. Mm.
Now, this is something if, if, cause like tracking how you've grown and how you've grown on these different platforms, cause you're very big on all platforms, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. Where would you suggest somebody start? Let's say that there, there's something that they want to put out into the world and they want to show people, right? If they want to take advantage of all those platforms, where should they start and then continue from there? Or does it depend on what they want to do? I think it depends. Well, one, on what they want to do. If mm -hmm. they want to start long form content, then getting on YouTube is just a good strategy. Mm -hmm. If they're willing to go short form, then I would say the good thing right now, and it kind of like, it, it kind of debates the point I just said, but because every platform is trying to copy TikTok, short form content, just short form content itself is a good driving force yeah. to be on every single platform. Mm -hmm. So then I would just tell someone, get a TikTok platform, make your video there, Use that same video and repost it on YouTube Shorts, repost it on Instagram and on Facebook, right? So then you have the same video across four platforms getting seen by four different demographics. Mm. That would be the best like basic strategy. Now, if someone was like, all right, well, Matt, like, I'm better in, in front of the camera. I want to do a <coughs> podcast. Well, then do a podcast long form. Get someone like Andrew on your team where they can cut it up, splice it up and make reels out of that content. But you're driving views to the full episode. Right, so it just depends on the strategy, but at the bare bones level, someone, if I told them nothing and didn't know what niche they're in or what they're trying to do, I would say get on short form because that's where the attention is. Yeah. Right, social is just about of attention. Yeah. What platforms give you the best attention? Right now, YouTube Shorts is, a, is probably the best out of the, all, all the short form platforms to get you that organic reach. So I'm, just like Gary says all the time, like he's after attention. And right now it's on social media and in 20, in 10 years, it might not be there anymore. Mm -hmm. So then you have to pivot onto the next thing. And most people aren't, they, they, they get stuck in what got them there. Mm -hmm. And that's where they struggle, where you have to just be able to adapt on the fly as it comes. Yeah. Yeah. Gary always says, uh, you got to be where the people are and they're on social media. Yeah. Um, would you say that like somebody needs a higher end camera? Cause sometimes like in memory, like sometimes in the past when we've tried to do stuff in the gym, we do like the high end lights, the high end cameras and we're like, this is going to be dope. And then it kind of flops and then somebody will be on, you know, selfie cam and yeah. it's like, how did that get millions? <laughs> and then this high production thing that we obviously put a lot of time into just completely flops. And I know I just kind of answered the question, but what I'm getting at is like, what, what are some of the things that people need in the beginning? All you need is a smartphone. A lot of the reason that I've made most of my content right off the iPhone with no tripods, with nothing else, is I want to just show people that like anyone can do this, mm -hmm. right? If you, if you do this long enough, if you just like anything in the gym, just like running, if you do content enough and you practice that talking in front of the camera, which is not like a normal thing. I don't think any human was designed to be so comfortable <laughs> to talk in front of the camera, right? But what happens after you build in reps? Right? You do enough push-ups, you get a bigger chest, a stronger triceps. You make enough videos in front of the camera, you'll get better. So I think, Andrew, to answer your question, like instead of using the excuse of, I don't have a DSLR, I don't have a microphone, I don't have this, I don't have that, start with this device that's a $1,200 device that is literally as powerful as presidents from the 80s that they ran the country with, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about that concept, these every single human has a smartphone. Mm -hmm. Start here. As you build traction, as you build that muscle, then upgrade to the entire studio setup. But at first, this is the barrier of entry. There's no friction here. Yeah. Edit off your phone, edit off the TikTok app. Everything could be done with this phone. Do you have any apps that you suggest for editing stuff? I would, I would get CapCut or InShot. And those are two very basic ones. I think there's free versions of both. Mm -hmm. And I think if you buy the pro version, it might be 20 to 30 bucks for the year. And just get the pro version so you don't have to see the ads and shit. Just, that's your $20 <laughs> investment to yourself. You know, because the platforms are free. Get the editing app or just edit right in TikTok because I make a lot of my videos like that. Mm -hmm. How do you turn uh, attention into money? A couple ways, right? You can, how I've done it is, well, the main way I do it is through brand partnerships, right? And I'm lucky. So that for us would be like sponsored sponsors. ads for the podcast, right? Exactly, yeah. right? Where someone's like a... Uh, a, brand's, a brand is going to say, hey, Matt, I want you to make this type of video for me, right? Talking about this running shoe, right? And then they'll compensate you for that video exactly. Now, when you're starting out, you're probably going to get a lot more, hey, do this one for free in exchange for apparel, in exchange mm -hmm. for shoes, whatever it is, like an in-kind. And that's a great way to build a relationship with a brand or a business. From there, if you do good work and the video gets good traction, then you have the leverage, then you need to now understand how do you negotiate for yourself? Like what's the standard rate, right? Mm. And on that process, like I, I had no idea. It's like consulting. You're just like, oh shit, let me see what Mark will do. 
thousand dollars and then you say and then mark's like that's way too much and you're like shit i should have said 700 <laughs> every single human has that feeling of like i left some at the table but when someone says yes you're like thousand oh, bucks shit. that's it yeah, yeah i guess you know? said something else 100 <laughs> percent. so it's 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 one of those things where one the brand partnerships is one thing if you don't want to do that you can push out an ebook you can push out a course you can create a product um you can create apparel Right, so there's so many different ways to make money as an entrepreneur or a business. Can I just stop you for a second. Do people like? Do people need to maybe get over their anxiety about whether they're going to be seen as someone who's like shilling stuff? I, I, it's the sooner you can do that, the more scalable you can create your business. Right. I think even for me, I struggle with that because I always had this Gary Vee mentality of jab, 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 right hook, yeah. give, 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 ask. Right. But when you ask someone, you just can't expect anything in return. Right. If you have a twenty five dollar product or a hundred dollar product, if you know that it's valuable, you're not going to be so upset to sell it, to yeah. pitch it. Right. And if you've given enough value, it's not you're not like you're not like uh, it's not like you're just like hitting someone in the face without giving them a warning. Mm. Right. Like you've given them some stuff and now they're giving you some feedback back. So I think even for me, it took a while for me to actually get over that hump as well. I didn't push my first product until two and a half years of making content mm -hmm. for free. So for me, it was a struggle personally because I was like, I don't want to monetize until I have to, right? Because if I was able to make enough money through brand deals, and at that time, Mark, I was just personal training. I made my money as a trainer. And then the content was the side hustle because I knew building platform or building content online is a sustainable business because it'll live there forever. But me spending one hour of my time with each of these clients my time is always getting exchanged for money. Mm -hmm. And at some point, we only have 24 hours in a day. If I'm giving it up to everyone else, then I'm not gonna have any for myself. So to answer your question, figure out you know, how you wanna monetize, right? And it could be in many different ways. You can just put out content. That could be your monetization source, right? At that point, it'll lead to certain things, whether it is an ebook or a course or um, brand deals or whatever it is. But there's so many ways to make money nowadays you got to get creative enough and have enough curiosity to go chase that stuff yeah. and just go seek it because it's all online. But I will add on to that too. Like if you're someone who's trying to build something and maybe you do want to work with companies, work with companies whose products and services or whatever it is that you know is actually legit. Because there's a lot of companies that will give people money to say, hey, I like this, mm -hmm. but those products are shit. Yeah. One of the reasons why I think we've been able to do pretty well. I'm, I'm totally open saying this is because the stuff we use has actually improved our lives. And the people, whenever we show it to people, it improves their lives. Mm. So we have trust because we're continuing to give people things that's actually going to push them forward. So make sure that whatever it is that you're going to be talking about is truly going to be something that is going to help the person that you're trying to help, not just get money. Speaking of, do you have an eight sleep mattress? <laughs> <laughs> this is great. He's told me about the eight sleep mattress. I don't. And I'm actually very intrigued about yeah. it because- uh, We'll get you one. Yeah. I, I would love to test that yeah. out. I would love to get that. I yeah. I mean, we that. love to share the stuff that, that we've had success with. And we've when we have other people on the show, uh, they'll report back to us and be like, man, that's really sick. It really helped a lot. So yeah. and I, think I think to that point, beneficial. if you're someone starting out, look around at your house. Mm. Start there. Because someone's going to be like, but oh, I don't have a following. Well, okay, you don't. Well, start exactly with, with the objects and items that you already purchased because you're purchasing it for a reason. Whether it's good or not, you clearly have some affiliation to the brand, right? So if you're eating Magic Spoon because you know that regular cereal sucks, make some content around eating that cereal and why you eat that cereal, right? So a lot of times the creative genius is happening with the stuff that's in your home. Mm -hmm. Start there. Mm -hmm. If you really are struggling to get some ideas around, oh my God, I don't know who to reach out to or you know, Nike's too big or Under Armour's too big. Well, okay, if you use 10,000 or Gymshark or any of these other brands, well, use other brands that you're already buying as a mm -hmm. consumer and let that be your truth. Yeah. That's storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. And then utilize that in, as, as your content in that sense. Like this thing, I actually bought this thing. They yeah. don't work with us, and they, but it's a really good fucking product. So if they did, that'd be cool. But like <laughs> seriously, if there are things that you use, right, make something from it. There's also uh, the value of, of finding things that are maybe uh, like a little bit niche, you know, like uh, toe spreaders if you're a runner. Uh, you know, you're, whatever shoe company you're with or whatever shoe deals you might have, 
Uh, they're not going to be pissed at the toe spreader company because yeah. they don't overlap. Uh, hostage tape would be something uh, as well, where it's like, well, not a lot of people make that product, so it's like a niche thing that I can uh, fill a particular category with. And what some people, you know, they worry about like uh, being represented or representing too many different things. But mm. I think I think we have a tendency to really overthink these things. And again, it's going to be. First of all, you should stay out of your comment section probably yeah. as like, what is it that you're searching for when you're looking at your comments? Uh, but secondly, uh, people don't really think that much about the different things that you're, <laughs> that you're representing and what's wrong with representing 10 different companies. What's wrong with, there's nothing wrong with it at all. You're good. Yeah. You're, you're, you're monetizing something that you believe in. Mm -hmm. You're like, these things are things that are really helpful and useful to me. I think you might find the same. 100%. And I think when it's authentic, you don't feel so shitty about it. Yeah. If you're actually using, I actually drink super coffee. Yeah. Before I worked with the Seco mm -hmm. Bros, I was drinking their stuff, right? And I think the same thing goes with the supplement company I work with, with Promix. Mm -hmm. Before Dev asked me to be an athlete, I was a consumer. And then from that consumption, I went to an ambassador and then I killed the ambassador program and they brought me on as an athlete, right? I think for so many people in this space, if you're getting into it, don't just chase after money. Because at some point, you're always going to be a victim to it, right? Chase after, like, work with the brands or build your own brand. But if you aren't going to build your own brand, work with brands that you actually trust and use. Because I guarantee you that the returns will happen. Yeah, what about, um, like, maybe being on the hook for something? Like, if you, uh, I'll just use uh, Nike or something. You're like, I promise I'm going to post on social media or something. And they're just like, okay, but we need, like, I don't know. Like, I guess the question is like, how, how much is too much to give in order to just receive, like, let's say product? Mm. Because I see that, like, I get hit up all the time where it's like, like, oh, that'd be kind of cool to get whatever that is. I'm like, but I don't want to post about it because I don't want to be on the hook for something. Yeah, I think, I think it's a personal decision that you have to make and like understand where you're at in, in your level of content, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like, are you pushing out so much content where it's just another video that you can just add into your queue? If that's the case, then I would just say do it, right? Mm -hmm. But if they're bugging you because you feel uncomfortable with the script that they're giving you, you feel uncomfortable with what they want you to say and all those things. And that's a little bit different because if it's not authentic into your voice and to your language and to how you actually communicate your content, mm -hmm. then I think it's never good to do that, right? But if it falls into your actual communication style, like a lot of the brands I work with never dictate the things I say. Well, they have some small tweaks here and there, of course, but they're never like, oh my God, Matt, you need to say mm -hmm. this thing, this line, this sentence, right? Because people feel that. People know when they're getting sold, right? So I think for, for anyone listening, I think be smart with the brand itself, right? If they're asking you to do hoops and ladders and to do a bunch of crazy shit, then I just, I would be upfront and be like, hey, I'm not comfortable talking to my community in that fashion. I would rather do it in my way or let's just not, let's just not do this. McDonald's. You know? The breakfast of champions. I've been eating McDonald's since I was six years old. It's helped me get big and strong. Is that Go right? to your local Mickey D's How today. How many sausage breakfast sandwiches uh, have you eaten? <laughs> six to seven every single morning, Mark. Wow. Yeah. That's about 42 a week. That's how people can look like you. That's how you can look exactly like me. Six pack abs and a smile worthy Isn't of McDonald's. Of Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> if, not, if they didn't bring on Ocho Cinco, I don't think they're going to look for anyone. At this point, they've killed the game without anyone. You know? Yeah, yeah. That's, true. that's true. Very true. Oh, mm. man. That's a really good point. What shoes should people get? People are asking oh, about shoes. People are obsessed about shoes. What do we got going on with shoes? This is my thing with shoes. It's just like a diet, right? Like, you know, there's no one size fits all approach. What works for you is, might not work for me. So I think what I would tell someone is go to your local running shoe store, whether it's a Fleet Feet, whether it's a Roadrunner Sports or, you know, local boutique store. Typically they have someone that's experienced enough to look at your running gait, that's a good your point. walking gait, or they have a 3D scanner, which is going to scan your foot and analyze where do you have pressure? Are you a low arch, high arch? Do you pronate? Do you supinate? Is your foot even the same size? There's so many dimensions of our foot that we don't actually understand as humans mm. because how many people really care about it, right? They just say, oh, I've been an 11 my whole life. I'm going to squish my foot into 11. Mm -hmm. I thought the same thing. My left foot is an 11 and a half. My right foot's an 11. So Ooh. now all my shoes are 11 and a half. So I think even at that point, Go in, get analyzed for your foot. If you don't want to do that, then at least have an understanding or have someone look at how you walk slash run, right? Because if you are super pronating or supinating, you're going to want a stability shoe. 
If you're neutral, then you can probably just get a neutral shoe, something that has mid-level cushion, something that can just get you to point A to point B. And then the next thing is like, all right, well, how serious are you taking it? Like, how much are you going to run? Like, I wouldn't suggest someone to go out and get a carbon fiber shoe if they're just going to run a couple days a week. Mm -hmm. Just get a daily road training shoe, right? So what, what does, what's the difference between like a road training shoe, like you're mentioning, and a carbon fiber shoe, like the super shoe that you guys use, yeah. the Nike Airfly? It's the difference is one is designed for performance and the okay. other is designed for durability. Okay. Right, so a performance shoe, the super shoe, the Alpha Fly, it's designed to have less wear and tear. Mm -hmm. The shoe gets used up more. You can't get as many miles in that shoe. So part of the reason of using it for races is you want to maximize the cushion in that shoe. The, the carbon fiber plate gets worn down after X amount of miles, just like any tire, mm. just like any shoe. It has like a snap in it. Exactly. So once that plate starts to bend more, because when you first get the shoe, no matter how strong you are, it's pretty hard to break that plate. Yeah. And you can, that, might, that might be a good video, actually, if you could break a carbon fiber <laughs> shoe. <laughs> um, but those shoes are designed for when you're really trying to seek performance or go really fast. So mm. I would use those shoes for races or long runs that you're simulating marathon paces because that's as close as you're going to get to like simulating the race. Mm. A daily training shoe, which is pretty much all the other shoes on the market, are utilized for when you're going on day-to-day -day miles, when you're going on that track workout, when you're going in the trail, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Having different shoes is just like having different tires for your cars, right? If you're in the winter, you're going to want snow tires. Right. And then that's kind of like your performance shoe. And if you are in the trail in the mountain on a Jeep, you're going to want all weather purpose tiles, whatever it is. And if you're in a sports car, that might actually be more like the performance shoe. A sports car is mm. going to be super light. It's going to get you to point A to point B. If you're in a Ferrari, that's like the Alpha Fly. Yeah. Right. And every shoe is designed just like cars or just like car tires in that sense. So there's a purpose for it. And that's why I always tell people, I'm like, dude, get out of your carbon fiber shoes if you're going to the mall if you're going to Trader Joe's, if you're walking around the office, because why do you need max cushion and a carbon fiber plate where your foot doesn't feel the floor anymore? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my whole thing with the running shoe stuff, with the carbon fiber shoes. Yeah. What's with all these things, the tracking everything? You got two watches and you have an aura ring on too, I think, right? You have two watches? On? I do. I have two Coros watches right now. And mm. part of this is I actually, they just <laughs> sent me this one. It's comparing them to each yeah. other. Yeah, <laughs> I'm comparing the data and, and oh. a lot of it is because the GPS signaling. Oh, you are comparing them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's what it is. Um, so the Pace 2 <laughs> is kind of like the beginner watch, right? Yeah. This is the watch that I would recommend for most beginners. It's a low barrier of entry. It's $200. What's the brand? A Coros. Never heard of it. With C O R O S. Yeah, C O R O S. Um, but nowadays, Mark, like all these wearables, they give you a lot of the same data, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of figuring out which one you like more, or, you know, which is the best bang for your buck. Coros is a brand that I've gotten to, you know, hopefully we're in talks of doing some some work with them as well. Um, but it's a brand that I've just I actually started to convert and like more. I've wore garments in the past when I did ultra marathons, um, but this Coros Apex 2 can pretty much do exactly what my Garmin did. Like literally, it lasts like thirty. It, it can last up to twenty days, I think. Um, I would say if you're a new run, a new runner, you might not want your watch to do a crazy amount of stuff. I agree. You might want it just to like kind of the bare minimum. Yeah, your heart rate and give you uh, your um, your pace. Yeah, and like and that's it, about it. An Apple Watch can do that. You know, the right. pace too can do that. I wouldn't spend more than two hundred bucks on a watch if you're just getting started, right? Um, the Aura Ring itself, I just have a friend who's an ultra guy who works with Aura. I was like, dude, I'd love for you to just test it out. And I'm like, all right, word, send it over. And, and I've just been wearing it for the past week. I've actually don't really wear rings. So it's kind of strange for me to have this on. Mm. Question, have you noticed that your Aura Ring has a different step count than maybe your Coros watch? Because I noticed like the step counting is different on this. Like, it says I get more steps with this versus my Apple watch. I actually haven't compared Okay. So I'm going to look at that, actually, as I get, get to the airport. I'm going to be like, hold on, let me just see yeah. how many they tracked. Um, but I was telling you, like, when we're in the gym, it is kind of annoying to hold weights with this. Right. That That is a little bit annoying for me. I'm still getting used to it. But um, I think wearables are, you know, it's a good piece to have, but it's not a game changer. I mean, I have some friends that don't wear anything. And they just go off feeling. Badass. And like that's an amazing thing too, right? Where you get detached from these numbers and metrics and heart rate and all this shit where, shoot, the indigenous people didn't have shit. <laughs> they got the job done. Ooh, you know, slippers. and sandals and flip sandals. And slippers, right? So it's one of those things where this stuff is awesome. But now so many people get so fed up into the data and they're just like consumed in it, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you look at the sleep data and stuff like that? Oh, Do you for sure. mess with that? And for sure. I mean- You sleep pretty well or- I sleep- pretty damn well. I think, you know, a couple months ago I was struggling a little bit more. I was getting like, you know, six, six thirty. you know, just kind of like, that would be my, like, 
that would be like kind of like my peak. And even though on the whoop, I was wearing the whoop at the time, it would tell me I'm in the green because like that was like kind of my cycle of like I hit right out of rem and then woke up. And like it still showed that I had good recovery. But I think as I've kind of gotten deeper into some of my marathon training, I just, I know that sleep and nutrition is going to be two of the things that you can control and they're easy wins to get on the table. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to get into sleeping more. So even the Aura and both of these Coros watches, I wear them when I sleep, they track my sleep. So if you're out there, if you have one of these watches, like you don't necessarily need an Aura or a Whoop. You could just wear the watch and it tracks pretty much everything. It doesn't give you as much detail as like the Whoop app or the core, uh, or the Aura app, but it's enough data to give you a baseline of like mm. how much deep sleep or REM or if you're awake up at night, like X, Y, and Z. So it's good. It's good information. Yeah. And you're about to sleep on a smart mattress. So exactly. You're gonna be tracking mm. Even freaking better. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. Sure thing. Thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. Please drop those comments down below. Let us know what you guys think about today's conversation. For everything podcast-related, nailed it. Hey, good shot. Uh, powerproject.live. Um, links in the description, podcast show notes, all that good stuff. Uh, follow the podcast at MB Power Project on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. My Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z and Sima. Where are you at? Discord's down below. Free Matt Choi. And see my yin on Instagram and YouTube. And see my yin on TikTok and Twitter. And you Matt, where can people find you? <laughs> you guys can find me on Instagram and TikTok, Matt Choi6. And then on YouTube as well, just Matthew Choi. <laughs> We, Don't forget your uh, workouts are only as good as your recovery. So mm. uh, implement a lot of uh, what Matt was sharing here today. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Peace. Bye. You got to change your name to the Bib Mule. <laughs> I, I, told my, I told my brother, I was like, we should make a whole nother account. Yeah.